invite Abby and Mary to come up um, <laughs> their presentation. Perfect. Okay, so I am Abby and this is Mary. And we're going to be talking today about, she might just hide, so <laughs> don't mind her. Um, we're going to be talking about Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC, as we'll refer to it throughout the presentation. And we're going to be giving more specifics about how it's useful for people with cerebral palsy. And so, let's see if I can, let's use the arrows. Uh, these are the two programs of the Weissman Center through which we work on using augmentative communication. The Communication Aids and Systems Clinic, or CASC, provides clinic-based care, and the Communication Development Program provides community-based consultation. And so we're happy to answer questions about this, the programs more, but in the interest of time, we're going to kind of jump right into some underlying concepts about AAC. So here we've included the definition of AAC from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And what we want to make sure people know is that AAC does include a wide variety of tools, including things that don't need anything outside of the person or their partner's bodies, all the way up to very high technology tools. And so there is a wide variety out there to meet people's needs. The definition talks about those with severe impairments, but we would like to stress that AAC is relevant for anybody who can't meet all of their communication needs using speech alone. So not just those necessarily who are who would be seen as severely impaired, but anyone in that category. And so now Mary's going to jump right into some of the research. <laughs> all right. So Abby and I uh, reviewed the current research literature probably from the last 10 years. And in looking at those findings, um, the research notes that roughly 60 to 85 percent of individuals with uh, cerebral palsy have some type of communication impairment, and as many as 25 percent of those individuals are considered nonverbal. Um, while some children with cerebral palsy may outgrow these um, challenges in communication, most go on to have long-standing uh, difficulties in this area. And even if children with early risk factors develop functional speech, we believe, and the research supports, that AAC does support other skills such as language development, cognitive development, and social participation. So even though there is a high incidence of need for AAC in this population, the evidence shows that there are significant barriers to accessing AAC. And some of those are listed here, which include lack of professionals trained in AAC, lack of sensitivity to individual needs and training for families and teams, and lack of resources related to AAC, including access to and funding for services as well as devices. So then, we examined how AAC incorporates with other services and supports along the age continuum. So starting with early intervention, and the research there shows that AAC is a tool in language intervention. It supports speech and language development, both receptively and expressively. It provides a modality for successful communication and interaction with the goal to prevent a failure of communication before it happens. And it's considered by many as an actual first line of intervention services. It supports overall developmental progression, including cognitive skills, literacy, and social skills. And research really does support that AAC should be in every early interventionist's uh, what we call toolkit or array of uh, services they provide. Moving further along the age continuum when children are typically receiving either school-based and or outpatient clinical services, the research shows that what many consider as traditional speech and language intervention often takes priority um, with AAC goals being underrepresented or even missing. Uh, we find this in, in, as an interesting or we find this interesting because AAC is an expected area of clinical competence for speech and language pathologists. And generally, low tech tools are, they're generally available to most speech therapists. And 
you don't need the really high tech or sophisticated technology in order to introduce AAC concepts. Despite this, children who have any noted uh, speech are actually less likely to receive AAC services. And we can talk a little bit about that um, later. Uh, conversely, children with more significant dysarthria and language impairment are often excluded from AAC. And the thought there is that perhaps because of the complexity of their needs, their therapists and other staff support are uncertain of where to even begin. And research shows that anywhere from 32 to 43 percent of children who would benefit from AAC did not have any AAC goals in their IEPs. So then, moving further up the age continuum to young adults, <coughs> sorry, and adults related to post-secondary educational, vocational, and community integration, research shows that more individuals with cerebral palsy are attending college, volunteering, and working, and living in the community with higher levels of independence. And given this, there is a need for more complex communicative interactions with a greater variety of people across more environments, notably for topics such as self-determination, safety, and establishing relationships for social closeness and to mitigate loneliness. And as this group moves out of traditional school-based therapy, services from AAC specialists are essential to support vocabulary expansion, language development, and use of more complex uh, device features such as computer access and accessing social media. And there is also research that shows there is effectiveness in pairing experienced AAC users as mentors for younger individuals who are navigating between school-based services and transition into the adult world. Then, in a separate but equally important category, we looked at the research related to inpatient and medical care, including need for training of nurses, physicians, and inpatient therapists. And the research shows that individuals with cerebral palsy require more frequent hospitalizations and medical care than typically developing population, specifically noting that children with cerebral palsy are hospitalized two times as often and for longer periods than typically developing children, and adults have a three-fold increased risk of having adverse effects in the hospital compared to adults without communication difficulties. So given this higher incidence of inpatient admission and risk, there is an implied need for additional strategies to support those with complex communication needs when they are in the hospital or in medical care situations, such as training inpatient staff on AAC devices, having an array of AAC tools available, providing written health information, and collaborating with caregivers. And it was interesting that the research notes that while many strategies have been suggested, there's actually very little evidence looking at whether these strategies have actually been implemented and or studied for their effectiveness. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Abby. <laughs> okay. So one other area that we found a lot of information about in our review of the literature and we wanted to include are these myths about AAC. And so we hear these frequently within our practice. So what we've done is put together some more appropriate facts about why AAC is very effectiveness and the research that supports that. So I'm just going to buzz through these um, kind of quickly. Um, one myth we hear is that AAC is a last resort intervention and it's only used when speech has somehow failed. Or that use of AAC hinders speech development and if you use AAC the person may stop talking. Another myth that comes up are the idea that a person has to be a certain age or a certain cognitive level or show readiness skills before they should be introduced to AAC. And then a, a, the last one we put on here is an idea that AAC has to be presented in some type of hierarchical order, like you have to move from real objects to pictures of objects to symbols, or you have to move from low tech to high tech. Um, the fact is that all of these ideas have been proven false through uh, scientific review or scientific evidence and instead there's a lot of information out there about how AAC is a really great tool for any early interventionist. It's a wonderful complement to any other types of speech and language intervention and it also supports just general development such as cognition and social competency and literacy. So AAC should really be incorporated among other 
treatments that individuals are receiving. <clears throat> So as Mary cited, up to 25% of individuals with CP are nonverbal, but up to 85% have some level of speech or language deficits, even if they do talk some, you know, they have some speech. And so we want to stress again that AAC is appropriate for anyone who can't meet all of their communication needs using speech alone. And so this is the idea that someone who's nonverbal may use AAC as their primary means of communication. But you might also have individuals who have some speech and they use AAC as a supplement or to repair breakdowns with their speech. And you may have people who are developing speech just slower than their typically developing peers. And so AAC can provide an expressive mode during that frustrating time, but also support their language development so that as their speech continues to grow, they have more and more things that they know how to say and communicate about. And so in our review of the literature, we didn't find any evidence that AAC has any harmful effects, such as some of those myths would suggest, but instead it offers a lot of great roles in complement to other speech and language interventions, as well as supporting cognitive literacy and social development. And so we're gonna jump into talking a little bit about different AAC strategies and systems, and we have videos of users using these, so I think it'll give you guys a good idea if you're not familiar with what AAC looks like. The first category that we might talk about is no tech, which means no technology needed. So this is the idea that there's nothing outside of the person or their partner's body needed for them to do some communicating. And if you look at this list, we all use these things. I'm using my hands as I'm talking with you. I'm using different facial expressions. And so these types of strategies can be taught and shaped to individuals who have CP or other complex communication needs to give them quick and efficient ways to communicate really important things. The next category we might talk about is low tech. And this is the idea of those like pictures or symbols that can be presented either individually or in books and boards. Um, and these are often used within modeling and teaching in early intervention, and they're used as a great expressive tool by many people. And I just want to note that just because we're presenting these in this no tech to high tech order, I want to reiterate that idea that there isn't a hierarchy, that somebody has to somehow master these strategies before you would start trying a voice output device with them or something like that. Um, so really our best communicators are people who use a combination of these different strategies in whatever environments they're most appropriate and useful. So here is a video of a little boy with CP who's seven in the video, and he is using his current low-tech book. And you can see it's set up with a main board, a core board is what we would call it for sentence construction, and then he has pages along the left side that include um, specific topics of vocabulary. <coughs> So you can see here that he's a really effective user, but what also makes him so successful is that his mom is a great support for him and she knows how he uses that system and can help him say exactly what he needs to communicate. The next category that we would look at are, or we'll talk about are mid-tech devices. And so these are kind of simple voice output buttons. And they might be like a Big Mac or a step-by-step -step button pictured on the side over here, or they might be simple overlay devices. And these tools can range from very simple functions like one repeated message, and they can go up to a little bit more complex where you may be able to start pushing two buttons to start doing some phrase-based communication. These are really nice tools for teaching beginning, com beginning communicators how to participate and interact and the power they can have using these types of tools to communicate. 
And here, you're gonna see the same kiddo, and he is using a step-by-step -step button to tell a joke. And you can see that he uses really nice multimodal communication with eye contact and turn-taking to engage his partners. Okay, the last category we'll talk about are high-tech speech generating devices, or SGDs. And I think this is often what people think about when they hear AAC. But we want to again stress that, that these should be considered along the continuum of all of those other options as well. And we should really be looking at all of the different parts of a system that put together a person's ability to communicate across their environments and partners. And so SGDs are, and I shortened my little bit about this, so I'm gonna refer to these notes. Um, AAC are, or I'm sorry, SGDs provide a voice output for people, and they often have, or typically include, dynamic linking pages so that people can get to different vocabulary and words that they need to express lots of communicative functions. Um, SGDs can be organized based on buttons that you push a single button and you get a full message. They can also be organized with individual words that you can put together to create novel ideas and messages, and you can use spelling. And most of our users don't use just one of these options, they use a combination for efficient communication with sentences or messages they say frequently, and then having the ability to be more flexible with some of that spelling and sentence construction. And so Mary's gonna start talking about the different ways that individuals with cerebral palsy and other motor impairments can access these devices, and then we'll have video examples within those. So within the feature matching process, uh, we critically look at how an individual is going to best access their device. And we have, like Abby said, a few videos here to highlight just some of these examples. So what you're going to see here is a little boy who is using his finger to access the device, but his overall coordination is decreased. So in order to be more successful and access more vocabulary on any one page, he benefits from having what you can see there is this little plastic overlay that we call a key guard. So in this next video, there's a girl who has not yet developed um, that isolated finger control. So she's using a telescoping stylus, which is the orange uh, pen-like um, thing she's holding in her hand in order to make her selections. And stylus has come in many different forms, but we'll just take a look at this one. <laughs> The song is appropriate for her developing that pointing <laughs> skill. <laughs> She liked it. Um, so, um, if an individual cannot physically touch the screen, we then look at alternatives such as alternative mouse options, um, head pointing, or joystick, which works just like a joystick on a power wheelchair or in a video game. And here you're going to see a young man using his joystick to move to the desired locations and messages on his device. And I just want to point out some of the visual supports you're going to see, which is a red box highlight on each location as he moves the joystick, and then a blue shrinking dot, which indicates like a dwell setting that's in place on his device to let him know how long he needs to leave the 
cursor there in order to make the selection that he wants to communicate. Oh, I might have to move it up onto the. There you go. What are the message you save on your school page? What are your jobs? Mm -hmm. You have to go out and see if you can find where you feel that message. You can ask about what you're doing with your money. What are the things you have to do with 1985? I'm going to follow that one. Because you're going to have to follow that one. you're going to see a child using directed eye movements or what we refer to as eye gaze in which a camera at the bottom of her device uh, picks up the position of her eyes as they move and again you're going to see a red clock um, that offers her visual feedback on where she's looking and how long she needs to look to activate the message. And then lastly, if an individual cannot directly access uh, their um, options, we assess their ability to use what we call scanning. And there's just a short video demonstration um, of two-switch linear scanning in which one switch is used to move along the choices on the device and a second switch is used to make the choice or select the one message that they want to communicate. So to kind of summarize, I think what we're hoping you guys can take away from this talk today is that current evidence-based practice really does support the use of AAC for individuals with cerebral palsy, and that early intervention and consistent naturalistic teaching are kind of the keys to beginning to implement AAC with this population, and with any population. Um, in terms of the long-term effective use of AAC across a person's lifespan, there really are supports that need to be in place, including continuing support for the use across environments and partners and expanding where a person is using their system, as well as ongoing attention to the AAC system's fit for their needs as those needs change. So for example, updating vocabulary if they get a new job or helping them with self-determination if they're hospitalized or if they have team changes or things like that and even updating their system as things become outdated with the way that technology changes. Um, and so we want to really make sure everybody understands that there is a wide variety of AAC options ranging from that no tech all the way up to high tech and these should all be considered together in order to optimally meet the needs of the person's communication, total communication across environments and partners. So I think now we're going to be able to open it up for questions for a bit. I can't really see because of the lights. So. Mm -hmm. 
We do have, um, we have someone here today, Mike Hipple is here and he's going to be part of the community panel, but he also asked in the, uh, that we would just read a little bit of information about um, an initiative that he's working on, the Augmented and Alternative Communication Network. And so I'll just go ahead and read this description quickly and then if you guys think of questions, we'll have time for that too. Um, it says, new in 2016, Wisconsin Augmentative Alternative Communication Network is a network for people with complex communication needs who use AAC, their families, and professionals. AAC are options such as communication boards and speech generating devices used by children and adults that are not able to meet all of their needs through speech alone. Mike, we're on the same page, I'm loving this. The network's mission is to connect Wisconsin AAC stakeholders together and give everyone a voice. The focus is advocacy, building awareness, creating an online forum to connect stakeholders, um, providing information and support to the AAC communicator and their family throughout their journey. The network is free and joining is easy. You can send an email and share now the network, share how the network can assist you. The network is affiliated with Isaac and Music. And I have the contact information here, so if anybody wants that, I can, I'll just read it out so you guys can write it down. But if you need it, you can also come up at the end. Um, so it's AAC Win or sorry, A-A-C-W-I Network. I'll spell it, A-A-C-W-I-N-E-T-W-R-O-K at gmail.com. And then he also has that you can like it on Facebook as well by searching um, A-A-C Wisconsin Network or Augmentative Alternative Communication Network. And we do have those little half sheets that you read off of. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So out at the front where all the resources are, the Wasteman Center table has copies of this if anybody wants to grab one. And then I think we have a question at the back. Oh, we have a question up in the back over here. My daughter has one of those communication devices, the Toby. And my question is, is it additional um, books on, on the Toby because, you know, I saw a lot of little child, um, like the wheels on the bus, you know, things like that. Are there age appropriate um, things? Because my daughter just graduated um, from fifth grade and they were still singing the Itsy Bitsy Spider mm -hmm. Show. You know, so are yeah. those um, things that I mean, the school wants? But are there age appropriate things for um, those devices? For Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the two part answer to that is um, first of all, this really sheds the light on the need. And the, and the great thing about voice output devices is that they do have a variety of page sets that move up. We call them page sets or groups of vocabulary that a person can use. And they're typically created to move from more simple and, um, you know, like you said, age appropriate levels and then kind of move up through that. Each device has a different range and they all vary. Um, but I, so I think the second part of the answer to that is working with augmentative communication specialists or your school team to look at what's already there is important to find something that's at the right level for your daughter. Um, but then also I think the customization is so key for these devices. So um, every device has ways to change what words are in it and change what pictures and what buttons are there. And so it does take a fair amount of input and changing sometimes to customize it just to the right level. Um, but I think a combination of finding a pre-made page set that's a good fit for her age and then adjusting with that customization to make sure she has all the right words in it is so important. Mm -hmm. um, also, I want to know, are there, and I know that symbol sticks up mm -hmm. there, are there more symbols like, you know, because I would like to teach her the correct terminology for her, her body parts, both mm -hmm. internal mm -hmm. and external. That's another really great point. Um, so most communication devices use uh, symbol sticks, which, like you said, these are an example of one symbol set called symbol sticks. Um, there is another set that's called PCS, or board maker symbols, that have been around for a longer span, but they're not as widely available on the devices. But in our experience, I feel like those have more of that 
like body, emotion kind of pictures. And so sometimes we're doing a combination of symbol sets so that we can get kind of to the very best representations of the different concepts that somebody might be, might be using. Um, or the other thing we sometimes will have to do too is look, uh, look at other picture and representation forms to find things that are appropriate to demonstrate those medical and kind of health body type topics. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, it looks like right up behind you, Teresa. Mm -hmm. How do you encourage both language development as well, you know, while you're also using these devices? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll let mm -hmm. Mary give a little bit of information too about the access side mm -hmm. of it. Um, but from the communication and speech side of it, we really focus a lot on those modeling and teaching techniques. And so we have a lot of kids who have more than one version of a system where we can have lots of words and lots of pictures available for us to be modeling. So we're using it and showing how it could be used for what we might talk about. And we're pointing to the pictures that go along with what we're saying. And we're using that really naturalistic, contextual use of those symbols. So they start to learn, even if the child isn't using some of those words themselves yet, they're seeing how they fit into their daily life and how they fit into different communicative functions. And so for example, we might have a kiddo who has uh, a page set that's got some things hidden that are easier for that kid to access themselves or adult. Um, but then we might have that same version with nothing hidden that we're using to be modeling and scaffolding them to move up to the next levels in that. And Mary might be able to even add anything mm -hmm. about the access side yeah. of it. I think too when I think about that question, um, a couple of things come to mind. One is that we're actually having the child learn that they're communicating the things that they would like to do so they might be saying I want to read a book and the book itself may be separate from their communication device but what they're asking to do and participating in is those literacy activities reading books and watching um, videos and participating in um, arts and crafts and projects that build on words and letters so it it doesn't always have to be within the device that the literacy activity takes place that the communication around the participation in age-appropriate activities that they might be getting at home and at preschool and in library groups and and different things is kind of what we're after there but then also there are some whether some of our families have their communication uh, software based on an iPad or again as a separate device they may be have the ability to access books that are on the device videos um, that are on the device um, and we try where we can to build in that access to those functions. Um, it just depends on the device and the person's abilities to kind of pair those with that. I think. For those of you on the front, Mike's just composing a, a message about an idea. A great book is Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. So the title of the book is called Out of My Mind. <laughs> the author is Sharon Draper. Yeah. Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. Mm -hmm. She's a, she writes about a character who uses a... So it was right. out, of, out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. All right. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Oh. Okay. The so one question I had is in regards to the uh, AACs for the uh, iPix stuff that are using either the iBase or the iPad type things. Um, are those, do they have updates available so you can put on the age appropriate stuff for your thing, or is that dependent on the, the speech therapist and the school system that determines that? I don't want to talk about whether you want to. Then 
time to go it alone versus him. Yeah, so I can just give kind of a brief answer because I know the next talker is coming, speaker is coming up, but um, so the devices do come with the full array on them typically. So the software that you get on there includes more than one page set. And so that does leave the room for teams or families to be moving up through them. I think the trick is it's very complex and the ways that you teach language um, within systems like this is very complex. So it's good to have speech language pathologists and occupational therapists input related to moving up the continuum and helping move forward in the best ways to teach efficient communication and efficient access. But they are all there that people can be moving through it without um, having to do massive changes or updates to their device. Hopefully that kind of answers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll be on the panel this afternoon as well. So if you think of other questions, please feel free to write them on those on the sheets. Later this morning. <laughs> oh yeah, later this morning. We don't go into the afternoon anymore. Thank you. I'm sorry, use the mouse. Where do I get mouse? I did that. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'm talking today about the uh, integrated approach to cerebral palsy, primarily by talking about brain structure and some of the differences than that stem um, out of out of the variations of the uh, etiologies of cerebral palsy and how does that translate into function. I would say that one of the nice things in the 20 years that I've been at the clinics at Weissman Center is that the AAC has come into the clinic now and it's been integrated as a standard uh, piece of what we consider available to people who come in um, to see us around questions about cerebral palsy. Um, so what is cerebral palsy? Palsy. The face of cerebral palsy is very diverse, um, as are the abilities and interests of the people with CP. So the definition of cerebral palsy, I think I skipped one, yes, um, that has been used in medical practice now comes from uh, Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology in 2005 was published, but consensus definition of experts in cerebral palsy is that it's a group of disorders of movement and posture it's a non-progressive neurological problem. It's related to damage to the fetal or infant brain, and it's often accompanied by co-occurring problems, which I'll talk about in a little more detail um, later. But cerebral palsy is defined by the motor changes, but is inclusive of any kind of issue that could stem from a change in the brain. So these are the four little pieces of that diagnosis. A non-progressive impairment, immature developing brain, which is the cerebral part of the definition, and then palsy is abnormal motor development or some challenge to motor development. So the diagnosis excludes conditions which are um, progressive or the neurodegenerative disorders. We have many clinics at the Weissman Center, so there is also a place for people with neurodegenerative disorders to come. And many people actually come to the CP clinic who have a neurodegenerative disorder. We don't split hairs. We just come where your needs are best met. Um, but that wouldn't be called cerebral palsy. It would have perhaps a genetic name. And it also includes conditions which resolve. Some children have some unusual aspects to early development, but then the motor system seems to click into a more typical pattern, and that um, then would not be cerebral palsy. But most people with cerebral palsy have changes through the lifespan. So even though the, what happened in the brain in infancy didn't change, it's the same set of neurons that are developing through life, the appearance can be very different in a teenager than it is in a two-year-old. So the, although cerebral palsy is non-progressive, it doesn't deteriorate over time, it, it isn't unchanging. So the 
definition of cerebral palsy identifies that a problem happened in the immature developing brain. And there's some variation in what people um, use as what is um, the developing brain, because development is a very long process. And some people, you know, maybe in development never really kind of reach what we would call full <laughs> developmental potential. <laughs> But it starts really with you know fetal development and the organization of the cells of the brain, and then into some really critical processes in early life. Um, so many people use one year as a common endpoint to say something happened in the first year of life to change brain development to use the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Um, I generally would use a more specific diagnosis if somebody at nine months had been eating well and was crawling and was doing very well with vision and then sustained perhaps a non-accidental trauma from shaken baby and had a brain injury. My preference would be to say that person had a brain injury at age nine months from trauma, um, which is a somewhat more specific diagnosis and cerebral palsy. But clinicians are variable. Some people would say that that person also has just cerebral palsy. Um, even if we know a specific date that something happened. Most of the time, the issue that relates to the cerebral palsy is something that happened before birth or shortly after birth. Sometimes we don't know when it happened. We're just as watching someone develop and saying, yeah, this is atypical. And, um, and it does involve the motor system, so we're calling it cerebral palsy, and we don't really know what happened. Um, so that's why we are a little vague with the cutoff on the time point. But usually in CP, we notice sometimes right after birth, but one side is moving better than the other. But typically it's between six and 12 months that we're more clear that this is, um, that uh, the person has what we would diagnose as cerebral palsy. And sometimes in people with milder problems, they may be 12 or 18 months old before we really say that, you know, that seems to be sticking around. Maybe that is a developmental disability. The next piece is that this is an impairment of the brain. So cerebral palsy would exclude other disability issues that relate to other parts of the nervous system, such as the spinal cord. Uh, muscles or nerves. So um, cerebral palsy is um, a disease or condition of brain development. But it includes many different ways that the developing brain could have difficulties. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk a lot about the first one, PVL or periventricular leukomalacia, the primary example because that's the most common change in the brain associated with cerebral palsy currently. Having an oxygen delivery problem to the brain is also a possible cause of cerebral palsy. Um, and I think people have a higher awareness of that etiology, but it really is a very small group of people with CP who had a primary problem at the time of birth with the <laughs> delivery of blood and oxygen to their brain. Um, some people develop in fetal development, brain malformation is how the cells arrange themselves. Like the Zika virus is causing a major problem with this phase of how the brain um, develops in the, in the uh, fetus. Um, and some children have had a stroke before they were born. And that is a similar kind of process. A stroke is an interruption to the blood supply to the brain, typically. The strokes occur in this region from what would be covered by what's called the middle cerebral artery. But some children have had a stroke before they were born. Maybe the artery didn't develop fully and it wasn't able to supply um, blood. We don't know a lot about the actual reason why the developing um, fetus has um, a stroke. but. Um, and then there are other causes. High bilirubin and jaundice was um, 40 years ago, a large cause of damage to the brain from RH incompatibility, and that one has largely been eliminated. So medical care has influenced a lot the etiology of cerebral palsy of what happened, because we had a big impact on the high bilirubin, which is toxic to certain areas of the brain, but also very low birth weight children have been surviving, and so we have a larger number of children um, who have cerebral palsy related to prematurity. Sometimes we don't know what happened, as I said, and sometimes uh, children have had more than one factor. Um, but the most common etiology now 
is associated with a really complicated set of events that happens to children that are born with very low birth weights and very premature. So the smaller and earlier the child is born, the higher risk that a cascade of different problems happen. Um, we're learning a lot about this series of events, uh, but it, it's a really um, complicated issue. And the area that gets most um, is most sensitive to this cascade of events in, in prematurity is uh, the periventricular area. And, we, and people develop what we call periventricular leukomalacia. And I'm going to take a couple minutes here to explain that. Um, so literally, that means peri or around the ventricle. The ventricle is a deep brain uh, fluid space. So if we look at, this is a half a brain, it's the space that's in the middle of the hemisphere. And it, it carries the spinal fluid. The spinal fluid is made in that area, and then it circulates. So it's the tissue around the ventricles, which is particularly vulnerable in children who are born pre-term. Um, and then leuco is the white matter, because that's what's in there. And malacia means thinning. So there's less white matter in the white matter areas around these ventricles. And I'll show you a picture of this on a, a, an MRI. So MRI is taken, is the person is looking up, so the eyes are, this is the back of the head. The um, person's right side is to the left of the screen. And I think you can hear me if I, if I walk, but this is, uh, these are the ventricles, and there's this rich, large amount of the white matter around the ventricles. And the purpose of this white matter is to do interconnections, right? To pull all of these pieces of the cortex together so that your function um, is related to the other parts of your body, your perceptions, your movements and perceptions, your emotions are all kind of pulled together into one, one space. And if we look at a child here with severe periventricular leukomalacia, we see these ventricles are much larger. This is the spinal fluid, the black, because the white tissue around it, the white matter tissue is really much smaller because much of it has died. And if you look, this is um, uh, some abnormal structure of the white tissue, but the gray matter around is relatively untouched by this etiology. So we see a lot of interruption in periventricular leukomalacia of the interconnections of the brain. Right, and relative preservation of the surface of the brain, of the cortex. So this etiology is going to have some manifestations that are probably unlike other etiologies, like having a stroke. So we look at MRIs, and most children now who have cerebral palsy will get an MRI. This PVL is that large um, greenish-yellow um, area, so it's the biggest by far, contributor to the modern population of the changes that are seen on MRIs with, uh, with CP. There's still this large group up in this section which have no abnormality on the MRI, which is always interesting that uh, people still can have motor abnormalities in development and not have a corresponding abnormality seen on the MRI. Now, we usually describe CP also by like the type of motor problem that you have. Where on your body does this affect you? And um, so, and it's divided, there are spastic types and then we call movement disorders, which is a different quality of movement. Spasticity is a increase in the reflex activity of the muscles so that we have uh, areas of, of stiffness and tightness co-occurring with weakness. And so the spastic types are described by what parts of your body. So the boy on the um, left uh, has arms and legs involved, the child in the middle, uh, one arm and one leg on the same side, which is the hemiplegic, and the um, girl with the walker has more involvement of her legs and her arms. We call this diplegic. Now, in adults, we would call this paraplegic or uh, paraparesis. We use para, and I, I don't exactly know why we chose to use di for children, but children who use diplegia, it's really similar to paraplegia. And so this um, 
Oh, and then the, as I mentioned, there are people that have um, different kinds of movement quality or the dyskinetic, which are um, extra involuntary movements that occur beyond what um, the person is trying to control. Many people have more than one type of movement problem and you really, you could have diplegia and hemiplegia and dyskinesia all together in the same person and that happens commonly. So people try to divide this out by uh, type of motor pattern and um, the red, um, black and gray are the spastic types. So the people with pure movement disorders, relatively small group that would be this extra pyramid. So most of the people have uh, one of the more spastic types, and you look, it's fairly evenly distributed. Some people have one side of the body involved, some people have the legs involved, some people have arms and legs involved, all four. And those three groups are about equally distributed. So here's my question, you know, in looking at this, is there a correlation between what we see on these MRIs and the uh, motor changes that the children have? Um, and this is not a really tight uh, correlation. I am going to talk about PVL and diplegia because that's the most common correlation and, and a very typical presentation for cerebral palsy. Um, so PVL is often associated with diplegia, but it also is the most frequent association with quadriplegia and hemiplegia. So the PVL is the predominant lesion and it can be manifest in many different ways. Um, birth hypoxia is going to likely affect the whole brain, so there's a strong association. Hypoxia is lack of oxygen, perhaps at the time of delivery or before or after. Um, but that's going to affect the whole brain at once, so that tends to be more in a quadriplegic pattern. And then people who have had a prenatal stroke, that tends to affect one side. So the people with hemiplegia often have a problem with circulation that was the etiology of the CP. Um, but again, there are many people who have PVL that only affects one side, and so um, that uh, etiology is seen throughout. I, and are you hearing me okay if I walk? Because I think it helps to point. As it, am I hopefully loud enough? So when you look at um, this, why did we have diplegia so strongly associated with periventricular leukomalacia? That's, I think, an important thing to understand. So it, this is the brain with the PBL, and the fibers um, that come down need to come off of the surface, and then they wind down through the area of the PBL. And if we look at the brain model, the fibers for the arm, which are relatively less involved in diplegia, are further out to the side. And the fibers from the leg come from an area here, which is very central. So the leg fibers have to pass very close to the ventricle to come down into the spinal cord and tell your legs what to do. The arm fibers are a little closer to the surface, so they may be traveling through a relatively healthier area of the brain. But this also <laughs> explains why. Well, if your PDL is very extensive and it goes all the way to the gray matter, then the arm and the leg will be involved. If it's less severe, it's going to be closer to the ventricle it's going to be much harder for those leg fibers to get through the area of injury. And so the leg fibers are disproportionately involved. One last comment on the motor system that we um, now incorporate into general practice. And we've had some discussions about this gross motor GMFCS. And in clinic now, if you come in, everybody is... Um, discussed in terms of a functional level. So this is how your motor function, how functional are you, how independent are you. Um, and many people, um, it, the parents coming in or um, people with cerebral palsy um, maybe aren't understanding the, the GMFCS, but um, if, if you have cerebral palsy or your child and we don't discuss this, it's a good topic to bring up. The GMFCS is a description of people's functional ability at five levels. So the first level, the people are walking and don't 
have any limitations on distance and don't require any equipment to walk. And the fifth level is the most dependent. So the person at level five would be having help to move in a manual wheelchair. In the middle, the people tend to use a little bit of everything. They probably have a wheelchair, maybe a power chair for distance, but are also walking perhaps in the house. So we have these five functional um, levels um, that were used to describe development. And um, this is probably the most helpful diagnostic tool to understand the future of our young child with disability. This is just a plot of the acquisition of motor skills over time. And you see that the five levels kind of announce themselves earlier in life. So we look at something that, you know, what would uh, a, a typical developing one-year-old be able to do like with cruising. So this would probably be the point in here about B, where somebody's starting to stand and cruise and take their first steps. So if we look at children with lower development, um, well, the people that don't walk actually don't achieve that. Does that make this make some sense? They don't get to B. And people that are, um, you know, taking till about two before they start to stand and cruise are starting to be in a, a group where the walking is less functional when they become older. So we have this information and we can hand that out. A part of the issue of prognostic information is, you know, do you need to hear something that maybe you want to know, maybe you don't want to know the typical outcome from somebody's early motor development. But this is an important concept. Um, we do many interventions for cerebral palsy, which are very important and very helpful. But they don't actually change a large piece of the prognosis. So we don't have the ability to take someone from level four to level two through therapy. We certainly hope that we help a lot of people maintain the highest functional level if they have the potential to function at level two and ambulate with a brace and a walker. Um, we hope that we can really enhance that and make that a lot easier for you and keep you from needing to use more equipment and be more dependent on others. So I think we're good at that, but, um, but we really can't, through all of the interventions we do, we can't change the GMFCS level fundamentally. And the last piece I wanted to talk about is that um, cerebral palsy is, uh, is defined as having a, a disturbance of motor development, but it's not exclusively a motor condition. So the modern definition of CP was inclusive of this wide range of co-occurring problems. Um, and just to briefly go through, associated concerns um, include problems with thinking. We looked at that brain with PVL, that will obviously affect interconnections for cognitive or thinking processes. Um, um, attention, learning disabilities, language development can be affected by the changes of, of cerebral palsy. Um, sensory changes are common and hearing is not as affected by this condition half as much as vision. 80% of people with cerebral palsy have some challenges with vision and there are many different ways that that can happen. And the other thing is that um, spatial perception and, and uh, tactile perception are also affected by these same conditions. Um, these are just really hard to measure and understand. If the feeling in your fingers is different, it's how do you ask somebody that question? Because this is how it's felt their entire life. That is totally normal for that person's experience. So it's hard to understand the differences in sensory processing that people have. Um, there is a comment on seizures are fairly common in the population, as well as changes in the autonomic system or your heart rate, your breathing, all of this is regulated by the brain, sweating. So any of these things can be different in experience for people with CP, as well as a lot of difficulties with the whole intake and output of nutrition. So um, uh, we spend a lot of time in the clinic dealing with these challenges from the swallowing to the constipation. Uh, then the muscle abnormalities cause a lot of 
challenge with the bone development and orthopedics will address um, some of these issues and how we incorporate care for orthopedic complications into our clinic. So if we combine all of this information, and if you look at one of my clinic notes, if somebody who came to the cerebral palsy clinic, it would include in a sentence, really all of the elements that I just spoke about. And an example would be a child with spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy associated with low birth weight and prematurity who developed periventricular leukomalacia, functioning GMFCS level five with associated cortical visual impairment, um, scoliosis and hip dysplasia, etc. And that would be a one sentence little nutshell if I'm going to say, and I have a question for you about neurology care. This is what I want to know. You know, this is the person um, and their kind of medical nutshell, um, and, uh, and then we move kind of forward. And in that context, you know, I have a question about, um, about care. So I wanted to go back, and this is a lesson I use a lot for the residents, and then I'll open to questions if I have time here, but this is again the PBL. So we talked about that, the motor fibers, and I'll bring my brain here with me. <laughs> so this this um, orange striped area is the signaling area for most of motor activity from the cortex. And we look at that, that's about a third of the way back. So those motor messages are coming here. So if we have periventricular leukomalacia underneath the motor area, we have a lot of trouble with the leg fibers communicating through there and the arms tend to do a little better. So we have diplegia or depending, quadriplegia or if it's on one side, hemiplegia, right? So we have these movement challenges. But what happened if your periventricular leukomalacia, which is common in premature, is maybe way in front of that and the back of the brain is doing fine. So what goes on in the front, that's a lot of our um, personality regulation. Our emotions are coming up and we just say, oh, I'm not gonna really act on that. I'm gonna modulate my behavior or I could go for that object and, you know, and uh, start um, fiddling or I can hold myself back. And so we decide, make decisions about regulating what we're doing. Well, there's a common childhood diagnosis if you have regulation issues that called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder for people that can't organize themselves and focus in on priorities and are more kind of randomly reactive to inputs. So if you had cerebral palsy, you know, we're going to send you to physical therapy and OT, we're going to really work, maybe AAC, and really work with your, you know, your motor systems and try to alleviate that. If you have ADD, we have pretty typical medical care systems that address maybe you would benefit from medications, maybe not, maybe there are behavioral supports that will really enhance your function. Um, certainly the school districts are dealing with this um, issue in um, great numbers. So those have medical diagnoses and treatments, but then we move back. And what if your PBL is, and the, here's an example, where it really is quite involved in this section in the back. And thus, section is all about sensory organization. It's pulling together your left side of your body, knowing what the right side is feeling like, and um, where is your body, space, like if I feel my body, but like what, am I standing up, am I sitting down, how does my body relate to the environment? And what do we call that if you can't perceive that very well? You don't know where you are, you don't understand the context of what the people are talking about, you're a little bit, uh, you know, scattered about, you know, maybe clumsy because you don't really feel where your body is compared to the chair that you're trying to sit in or you trip on your feet because you didn't integrate how big the step was. Um, that's a difficult disability. We've struggled for years to even find a name for this. We're calling it now developmental coordination disorder. I think that's the last diagnosis. Or some people call it sensory integration problems, which probably medically is the best description of these things. But I said we really struggle even with describing that, right? And <laughs> because we kind of a bias on the sensory system. And that group of children has the hardest time getting services, right? So we give great services if your lesion runs here, and then if it runs here, it's like, I don't know, it's no longer medical. It's just kind of um, strange how 
we have gotten into um, a struggle with treating um, whole people and wanting to look at the motor system but not the sensory system and treat them as if one is less important than the other. But cerebral palsy can equally affect both. And I, I, this is a very typical distribution of periventricular leukomalacia where the involvement is much stronger in the back of the brain and it's going to affect some of the sensory integration and nonverbal learning um, more so than other aspects of, of cognition or movement. Because you could have just the nonverbal learning challenges and not the motor problems at all. So that was the end, and I just a little plug for rehabilitation medicine is what our goal is is to look at problems like this as a whole person. And if you come in with any question, maybe toilet training, and we want to know about bladder control with people with cerebral palsy. Can you get an answer on how is that different for children with cerebral palsy? And so we want to not focus just on like your particular motor type, and this is what we do for that, but really on you as a person. And if you have any question about temperature regulation or anything that relates to the medical health of a person who has cerebral palsy, we hope to teach you about that and help you address that in effective ways. I don't, I, what is my time here? I think I'm... Oh, good. Okay. So I kept well within the time. So I'm happy to <laughs> talk about other types of problems and, you know, kind of go through um, what I went through with PBL, but I'd really be much more interested in if you had any questions about this topic. I just, I love to talk about brain problems and how that translates to function. So. Um, I'm going to back up to, so cortical visual impairment is, it implies that the processing of vision by the brain is impaired, but that the eyes actually work. So when we get an image, the eyes come all the way to the back. Um, so this is where it lands on the brain, but the vision is completely dependent on the white matter. So vision has to be pulled together. Um, hearing is much more in the gray matter in a sense, it's, it has to be less integrated. But vision comes to you all at once and you have to pull all of the vision that's available to be had together into an image and then decide what's pertinent to look at and then how to follow it through space. So vision is extremely dependent on the white matter. So people with cortical visual impairment can have, um, you know, it, it, if we look at the person with movement with cerebral palsy where they may have some weakness and difficulty coordinating the movements and some extra involuntary movements that come in, you can look at vision in much the same way. The people may not be able to see everything clearly. They may not be able to see everything consistently. As things move, they might lose pieces of the visual information. Um, and so they can have weak and disorganized vision. But the point on the CVI, and I think that we've been learning, is that there are ways to identify the best way to get the vision through. We have like, for example, like braces, right? We have ways to get vision in with high contrast, interesting objects, high, um, uh, using a lighted background, keeping the background more simple. There's a whole system that we can use with cortical visual impairment. And I think we're moving toward um, seeing that vision also can undergo a rehabilitation program. So we start with little movements. You know, if you have motor strength problems, we're going to start with low strength, slow moving exercises and we'll repeat those. We may be able to do the same for many people with cortical visual impairment and teach you how to see as we can teach you how to stand and then take a step. We can teach you to localize, we can teach you to find an object, then we can teach you maybe to start to discriminate and these are, we start with big objects and we can make them smaller and can really work and I, I think we've moved from looking at cortical visual impairment as something, oh you have that and you're going <coughs> to go on your merry way, there's no, glasses won't fix that so go away, it was, you know, kind of unfortunately the ophthalmologic model to the rehab model where we're like, we can help 
you with this. We need to look that. And usually through the school districts are doing most of this work. Um, but um, school visual impairment has moved heavily. Like 30 years ago, it was all about the eyes. Now it's all about PBL because this is our big group of children struggling with um, cortical visual impairment as opposed to blindness from losing their eyes due to ne uh, neonatal problems. But I don't know if that answered that kind of question, but I think that's one of the topics that kind of gets me excited to make sure everybody who's challenged with the visual impairment knows that we can, let's address this, let's get some court control there. There's a book, Chris, Christine Roman Lancey wrote a really good book about cortical visual impairment. She keeps it really affordable. But um, we should get her to come here and be, she's a great speaker. <laughs> Then, well, you can. Uh, You know, this, this came out in 2002, so certainly Kiana was around, but we didn't start using it more consistently as um, it was really probably the past five years. And we have these handouts now in clinic. So, um, the, the, you know, the <laughs> we've had a long relationship, you know, and we're here, right? And you'll ask your questions. And some people don't, you know, this is the challenge with this. So some people don't want to know much about this when their child is one year old, and that's fine. You know, when do you want to know more specifics, and when do you want to leave the prognosis a little more vague, and kind of say things will get moved forward, because they will. The, you know, the people at level five in the first year of life are really moving forward. Do you know? It's just that by age one, things have discriminated, and we can give you more specific information if you choose. So I have little handouts, and often I just give that out now, so it defines what the levels are. And I say, go home, you can read this if you choose, and you can see where your child is for the age group. And, you know, see, okay, crawling, sitting, you know, and see what your child is doing. And then if you choose, flip forward to the older ages, and then you can say, okay, that translates to, you know, this kind of mobility status for an adult. So we're hopefully have improved on how that's transmitted. But this publications that came after this um, initial study in 2002 were really very helpful in um, building that educational. So, and this is easily available, GMFCS, you, and the stuff that I hand out is, is you can quickly get it online and print it off yourself. So this has been made to share with families. This is the purpose of the GMFCS. It's a communication tool between providers but also for families. Yeah, but these are all under development, and so the next one is called the MAX tool, which is about hand function, the manual abilities, manual classification system. And, and so that's um, available. It's not in um, standard use, like if you look at a medical report, you're for someone with CP, or you're hearing about a medical study we looked at, efficacy of a baclofen pump, and our population was GMFCS level 
one and two, you know. That's typical literature now. So the max for hand function is not as widely utilized, um, but it's a very similar function. So that would be, that's more for hand function. And then there's one for communication, which is even newer and moving somewhat forward. So the, um, so we do have them for hand function and for speech. But these are motor classifications, so they don't, act, you know, they, they look at motor things, not so much um, level of independence. We do have other measures that, w that we use for that, but, um, but the, the, the GMFCS has become so common, I think it's helpful for everybody to know what that means because you're going to see it all over in the medical records if you see them. And so um, that's in the most common use. We might get them where the, and, 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 uh, <laughs> the MAX and the, and the CMFCS are also in the, in the kind of global picture. Yeah. Um, yes, it says that cognitive impairments, excuse me, the 40 to 60 percent experience cognitive impairments. I'm trying to figure out where does diagnostic overshadowing and presuming comments fit in? I'm sorry, what? I didn't hear. I, I heard a bit of content, but I didn't hear the last sentence. Where does. Yeah. You mentioned that 40 to 60 yep. percent of people experience 40 um, cognitive impairments. Where, in diagnosing that, where does diagnosing overshadowing and pursuing confidence fit in? This, this is a huge topic on looking at evaluation because um, there's such a range of uh, different kinds of cognitive changes that happen with cerebral palsy. Many of these are, um, one can have an impairment without having a disability because one could have an abnormality of ankle movement and function at a GMFCS level and be a cross-country runner of elite status and still have cerebral palsy. So the same is true with looking at cognitive challenges. For periventricular leukomalacia, one of the most common things that I would bring up is to write letters for the people that have a little challenge with higher level nonverbal processing, maybe some trouble with passing algebra, but are really very intelligent people and possess skills to get a college degree, but they often, you have to pass algebra, you can't come here and, you know, to this college. And so we have to like get over this, right? And so sometimes we are looking at a very small impairment, which doesn't have to contribute at all to disability. So there's a whole range to individuals who have really very severe cognitive um, delays and you know will remain nonverbal with limited language processing and we we also want to help understand and support people at the developmental level if it you know, is at, uh, in the lower range that really helps uh, accentuate the communication skills they do have um, so we do I, in general I would say everybody with cerebral palsy should have testing um, done at some point in their lifespan um, to look at trying to analyze this better because it isn't, you can't make generalizations about it. Everybody is so different, one person with CP to another. I, did I get into the sense of that question? So, you know, um, it, it may have a large influence on competency or it may have none. Is that a fair? <laughs>
this will come up. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to share with everyone some changes that um, uh, we're looking forward to, I think, over the next few years, uh, both at Wiseman and at uh, the, ch the Children's Hospital, hopefully to improve the care of children with cerebral palsy. And um, uh, we'll go through this. There'll definitely be time for questions and things afterwards. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So obviously from, from Michael's talk and, and everybody I think in this room knows that, that caring for the kids with CP is, is, is complex. Um, there can be many different medical comorbidities. Um, often getting to and from appointments can be difficult with uh, transport issues. Um, many of the children have multiple, multiple appointments at different, at different centers. And uh, not only are there appointments, there's a lot of tests and treatments that, that, that these children often need. And on the medical side of it, it's not easy either because you're taking care of medically complex children. And, and I focus on orthopedics, so I'm often thinking only about the orthopedic aspects when there are many, many other aspects to these children that need to be taken into account before we move forward with the procedure. And, and often, I think in the past, um, while, we've, while we've made some efforts to coordinate things, really we, we generally tend to see kids when we have appointments and, and fitting patients into our schedules instead of maybe, maybe doing the vice versa. So overall, you know, I think we, we, we take care of uh, these children very well between all the different centers that we have, uh, the clinics offered, here at Wiseman, the medical specialties provided across the street at the Children's Hospital, and then some of our pediatric uh, rehab and gate, gate clinic at, out, at, out of Middleton, I, I do think we kind of cover the basis of taking excellent, excellent care of these children. But the question comes up, you know, can, can we do a better job and can we make things easier, easier for patients and families? Can we improve communication between specialists? Can we make things better here? And, and probably two to three years ago, I think it's been two years now, I started getting more and more, more involved in, in these clinics. And really, both the, the CP clinic here, the spasticity clinic here, my own orthopedic practice across, across the street at the Children's Hospital, and then also attending gate clinic in Middleton. What, what became kind of obvious from being one person who's in all of those clinics is I would sometimes see some kids in multiple clinics. I might see them in gate clinic, in my orthopedic clinic, and in another clinic. And sometimes parents would say, I just saw you two weeks ago in your orthopedic clinic. Why am I seeing you here? And I would say, I don't know. Um, and, and so while some of the other kids I would see only in my orthopedic clinic that really weren't taking advantage of the, the comprehensive care that we, that we have to offer. And so with that, I started thinking, is there a way that we can make this better? And, and with the duplicated services, not only is it a bit of a, a, a waste of time for the family and perhaps me as a clinician, it also at certain times could be confusing if children were seeing myself and, a, and another orthopedic surgeon or seeing two different therapists, sometimes people were getting conflicting ideas of, of what should be done without wanting them. Sometimes it's good to have a second opinion, but sometimes uh, that, that just leads to more confusion. And, and other, other, other things are is that what, what tends to happen with, with each of these clinics is that you tend to have a little bit of siloing. We live in Wisconsin, so that's probably what everybody thinks about. But, but there's this idea, and it's kind of in vogue in, in, in the medical community to talk about siloing. And, and it's kind of, this is the business definition, it comes from the business world. But it's kind of, you get stuck in your own little area, and, and this says you don't wish to share information. I don't think it's that malicious when it comes to the medical providers. I just think we're busy and don't communicate well enough with one each other. And, and when we're at different sites in different specific clinics, there, there's a reason for that. But at some times, what that tends to do is, is it, it, it breaks down communication. And, and there's historical reasons, I think, based on the fact we didn't have a children's hospital a few years ago. Um, each of the clinics were kind of set up with a certain idea in mind. Um, but I, I think that has a tendency to, to limit the focus. And, and, and what's become apparent over time is you kind of have these great multi-D clinics that are set up 
to you know look at neurocognitive issues to look at mobility issues with these children that kind of keep the entire rest of the medical community kind of separated and and that's just what's developed over time is this is, is a little bit of siloing when it, when it it's not meant to be but it's just happened with the way that things have been set up and so next one here um, you know can't can, can we do better the, the 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 purpose of the different clinics sometimes becomes confusing people are like well I, I, my child has CP do we go to the CP clinic do we go to the gate clinic do we go to specificity clinic why am I seeing the same person in both of these clinics and it, it for for families sometimes that can be there, there is a different purpose for those clinics but sometimes it can get confused and even referring physicians some of our physicians that refer in sometimes they are for specific evaluations does this child need a baclofen pump or would they benefit from rhizotomy but sometimes it's i have a new family that moved to town with cerebral palsy can we get them in to see someone and and there's a confusion which clinic should they go to and and how how exactly that's run and and even from our administration higher up administration but in, in the hospital setting is why do you guys have Four different clinics for children with cerebral palsy. What's the difference between them? Even within our own institution, there's definitely some confusion about why we have these different things. And then finally, when when this happens, what what tends to happen is is the kind of group of kids and the patients lose their voice. Instead of being this big group of patients with needs, they get broken up into kids in different clinics. And how many how many children with cerebral palsy do we take care of? That can be kind of a complicated question to answer when we don't know the entire population because they're divided between all these clinics. And, and, and you might say, why is, what, what does that matter? When it comes to trying to follow outcomes and proving the care, having a kind of unified group and, and to know our population base um, across the specialties helps, helps us obtain data, helps us improve our outcomes. And then uh, on the other side of that, trying to obtain resources and for to advocate for the children becomes much easier if if we have a single cohort of let's say several hundred children it's much easier to go to hospital administration and say we need x in our clinics or we need to expand our clinic because we take care of this many kids but if you divide that 200 up over four or five clinics you know 20 30 40 patients may not be enough for the administrators to really say yeah that's worth worth our time and effort of, of helping out so so all of these things I think I think while we're giving excellent care we can we can we can do better and do more and so one of the goals was to see you know can we improve kind of the global global care of the children uh, within our region geographic region by by kind of transitioning a little bit from broken up clinics and silos into a more uh, centralized and uniform program and one of the things we wanted to do while, while we have kind of focused on this movement and neurocognitive aspect of cerebral palsy if we're going to kind of revamp our program can we include a, a more comprehensive group of subspecialty care and is there a way that we can do that both to tailor it to the specific patients we've heard you know that children are very different with cerebral palsy they have very different needs can we kind of custom tailor it to the children but but also in, in by doing that increase the, the the efficiency and then finally you know one of the things we'd like to do is kind of to take our program uh, from a, from a very good local program kind of to the national stage and can we become a, you know a nationally recognized center for for caring with children with cerebral palsy so make sure I hit the right button um, so really the idea is kind of to, to 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 take these three different clinics that we have going on or four different clinics and multiple medical clinics and kind of combine them now now the gate clinic isn't going away that's not what this represented but just for clarity's sake um, this will this this will help make it make it easier I think so instead of being separated clinics we're trying to go for a more unified program that's just what that was supposed to show okay so so one of the things and, and we've probably been working on this for the past six months I think now and everybody over here and Emily in the back and Tracy and Michael everybody's kind of contributed to really making this happen and, and, and Wiseman and, and AFCH administration have been very very um, helpful 
in helping to move this forward, but was to look at how can we expand our services, how can we keep what's good with the program we have without losing that, but how can we expand it and, and make it even better? And this is, the, the rest of the talk will be going through what, what we want to do and, and where we see this going. So over, over the next, actually it starts towards the end of this month, uh, what we'll have is basically two clinics, one at Wiseman, which will be a, a more of a developmental assessments clinic, one where we will, they'll be seen annually by rehabilitation, PTOT, speech, CASC, um, and for a better way to think about it, one, it's kind of to get a very good overview of where the children are at, making sure all their needs are being met, um, and, and doing this annually. And then at AFCH, this is more of the, the new aspect to this, um, is really we're combining a lot of medical services to be in one clinic. Now, people that have been to Wiseman for the multi-D clinics have already experienced where you're seen by all the different providers. You know, you're there for however many hours to see everybody and then you leave and everybody sees everybody, basically. Um, all the care providers see all the patients and vice versa. The medical clinic, what we're trying to do is to have this set up where if your child sees <laughs> neurosurgery to get their pump refilled, if you see me to have your hips checked out, if you see neurology for the management of your seizures, that instead of those being three different appointments on three different days that basically would try to coordinate that all in the same day. We're all going to be in the same clinic space every Tuesday. So we'll all be working kind of side by side each other and that hopefully will help help with some of the communication. Um, and and we're, we're, we're transitioning this forward, as I said, toward, towards the end of the month. Um, the other Obviously, many of the patients are already over at the Children's Hospital with these individual appointments in, and one of the things that that offers and what we've been able to kind of work with, with bringing all these kids and providers together on, on one day is that obviously lab's always there. Orthotics is going to be available to see the children if they need to be. If we need radiology, we have that accessible. Um, we probably will have some representation from wheelchair seating if there's seating issues that we can get uh, the kids evaluated while they're there. And then the other benefit of being kind of in, in the subspecialty clinic area is often if there's an issue that's come up where your child needs to be seen by GI because the G-tube's having, pro or by, by surgery or GI because the G-tube's having issues, we can have them come see them hopefully while you're there. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty excited now. One of, the, one of the questions is, you know, how does, how does adding more specialties to a clinic kind of tear down, you know, this idea of tearing down silos and getting to be a little bit more uh, comprehensive? And, and, and the idea is that, you know, one, we're going to try to have a single, kind of a single, let's see, it's a, word, a single um, entry point into the system. So for outside providers, we're going to have a single access and uh, Tracy, our nurse is back there, she's very excited about all this, of, of, of being able to help help coordinate this. The other is is between the two clinics, between kind of the, the, the Wiseman Clinic and the AFCH Clinic, there are going to be several providers that are kind of going to be working in both of them, and that will hopefully help keep some cross-pollinization between, between the two clinics. And then also just the unified oversight is, is, is to have kind of this team concept and some of the things that we're considering are kind of within the groups, both groups together, bringing them probably once a month. I don't know if they all know this yet or not, but is gonna be, is bringing them together either for presentations, just different kind of specialty idea presentations, just to keep everybody kind of this global perspective of these children outside our own kind of areas of expertise. And also kind of probably at least quarterly journal clubs kind of to do the same thing where we go over, you know, latest articles to discuss these things, which will probably be either one from a different specialty or we'll mix it up with different specialties invited. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I think trying to get everybody coordinated on, on different clinical research to get people working together across, across um, uh, specialties is, is, is very important as well. So again, when you start adding kind of more and more services, how, how, how are we going to keep this efficient? And I said, you know, that the single entry point should expedite access into the system and help minimize kind of this duplication of services and of specialties. 
we're going to have a much more robust kind of preclinical and actually postclinical assessment to determine the family's needs and arranging follow-up and trying to coordinate that clinic. Um, you know, and, and our attempts will be to coordinate as many specialty appointments on single visits as possible or that or different patients want. Some, some of our patients that are traveling a long distance want to do everything in one day. Other patients that have young patients that are going crazy running around the room, you know, are, are screaming and they can't tolerate being seen by this many people. They have other siblings. Um, really, you know, try if they say, I only want to come for an hour. I don't, if I got to come back four times, that's fine. I just want to be, we're going to try to custom tailor that to what, what the patient's family would like. Um, and the last kind of covers that. Um, Again, this whole this whole idea of single entry point this this will allow, allow I think quicker access because what tends to happen is if if a child is is getting referred to the CP clinic our CP clinic here we generally see four maybe six patients maximum a, a clinic that we have and that's because each of those each of those children are seen by everyone and so that obviously takes a lot of a lot of time not everybody trying to get into the system needs or wants that from the first get-go they want to come they want to be evaluated so we're in the medical system each provider and this may be getting a little bit buried into it but has their own scheduled appointments and so often there's going to be more available slots for people to get in quicker so that's the idea is that we can improve access into the clinic And then, you know, the, another way that we really want to expand, expand and enhance the program is, is getting a little bit more serious about measuring outcomes. Um, one, to help grade ourselves to know, are we doing things? Are we helping, are we helping families and patients take care of their, their children? Um, and, you know, having a really standardized way of doing this, both from patient reported outcomes as well as from, you know, having standardized objective scoring and measurements that we're, that we're all doing here. And then also is, is really we want to we want to get involved in this network called CPRN or CP Research Network. It's kind of a consortium of about 18 centers right now. It's growing as time goes on. They're they're really starting to get kind of into the idea of big data and collecting data to really know what is the best way to treat X with children with cerebral palsy. What do families feel is the best use of the intervention of Y? To really a lot of what we do is based on not great data and not great science and and really with technology the way that it is with the ability to um, kind of collaborate with multiple institutions we really should be able to answer some of these things and give family answers of this is what you should do with your child that has this problem and right now a lot of it is we have ideas we think we know but but really there are a lot of questions still out there and this should help us do that. Uh, Emily Meyer, uh, the NP for neurosurgery, many of you know, really has been involved in, in making this happen. And, and I think I think by 2020, I just kind of set that goal, it sounds like a good time to start it. Um, uh, that, 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 will, that will have joined it. We, we're, the, one of the things you may, if you're involved at all in the medical system or not, you may hear us curse about Epic and the electronic medical record, but this is actually one of the areas where um, EPIC, I think, will help us improve the care of these kids. Um, so, how are we going to do this? Um, this is a really confusing slide. <laughs> but but this, is, this, this is how it's all, the next two slides are kind of going to look like this, but this is how it's going to happen. <laughs> So, so right now, the, on, the, on your left there, is how everything right now essentially functions. And those are all the different clinics and probably more that some of the families here probably take their children to. And um, one of the things that we're going to do is our, our, spas our spasticity clinic is going to um, kind of be absorbed into this um, AFCH clinic. And those ch children in that schedule will be will be involved over at at the children's hospital, um, whereas um, the typical our, our, our CP what we're calling the CP and developmental assessment clinic will be here at Wiseman, um, and and both of these will be on Tuesdays, um, and so we're going to have 
essentially two clinics simultaneously going on, all taking care of kind of cerebral palsy, and that's going to be the focus with all of these different kind of, uh, I don't know, my arrow's not showing up there, but all these different specialties represented. Um, hopefully, over the next three to five years, what, what I would love to see happen in, in we've had multiple, I think, failed attempts at having this happen here, is to convert our gate clinic that we have now into instrumented gate analysis, which would be an awesome dream if it can happen. Um, and that would probably, like I said, probably next three to five years to be able to, be able to do that. Um, this is kind of the transition. Maybe this is even more confusing. Um, so, so really, most of the people here probably aren't new patients, so you can kind of ignore that top top aspect but but you may be getting calls or, or you may be hearing about this clinic the next time you go in for an appointment and or you may get a call before about transitioning your appointment onto a Tuesday and the reason for this you're kind of hearing what the reason for this is we're trying to coordinate all these different providers for you on a, on a day and so um, that's that's kind of what's going to happen over time then Likely the entry point will be the AFCH clinic that will be more provider specific appointments and then those patients will then be referred to Wiseman for a comprehensive yearly assessment as each year. Um, this is kind of the, the movement forward or the plan forward. Um, so as I said right at the end of this month well, the, the clinics will actually be will be starting, this division will be starting, and hopefully, as I said, over the next few years, we can, we can kind of transition this gate clinic into a gate analysis and kind of have that data to be able to go over at, at one of the other appointments. And, um, you know, some of the goals down at the bottom on, on the right-hand side, um, you know, over the next, from 220, that, that's, a good, that's a good time. Um, hopefully we'll have the CPRN up and going uh, hopefully starting to look at getting instrumented gate analysis. And then one of the other things that I, I've kind of not discussed with many other people, but discussing with you, is um, really trying to help tran improve transition both, both from kind of the newborn nursery into the CP clinic and then probably, not necessarily more importantly, but I think more pressing is actually outside of the pediatric realm into the adult transition. It's a huge national problem. We all realize it's a problem. I think once we have this clinic up and going, one of the charges is going to be kind of for each of the specialties to identify adult providers and kind of work maybe once a year, maybe quarterly, depending on how many children we have, but having joined appointments with the pediatric physician as well as the adult physician to help kind of tr smooth transition of handoffs for everybody because um, I think that'll be I think that'll be hugely important moving forward so um, just in summary there are a lot of changes occurring um, really our you know our, our goal is to help us deliver health care more efficiently for you guys and at the same time overall try and improve kind of the care for all the kids with CP moving forward and I'm happy to take questions Kiana's mom in the back <laughs> uh, you mentioned having um, one clinic for many different um, mm -hmm. specialties. Does that include, um, like, she has a, a general uh, pediatrician? You know, things like, you know, she was sick with ear infection or well checked. So the easy answer when we start in two weeks or three weeks now would be no. But that is our there's been some discussion about this and it gets into a little bit more of medical politics than anything else. But if that is something that you think would be useful, as many of us in this room feel it would, it would be, um, to make that voice heard that that would be something you would, you know, if you like the way the clinic goes, but you'd be like, you know, it would really be good if this could be, you know, people call it their medical home, or also 
you know, to have a general pediatrician, a primary care pediatrician involved in the clinic, that, that, that is what we would like, but it's not on the docket more for outside reasons than, than that. So we, we've, we've looked a bit into it. There's, I don't think there have been any, the biggest area where we've had lots of discussion has been on the therapy aspect of it, of how therapy is gonna be built and what's gonna be done at which place. I don't really wanna get into that. Uh, but but uh, out, outside, of, outside of that, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, actually, I think most likely we will be saving the insurance companies, maybe I shouldn't say this, a, a fortune on facility fees because the children aren't coming nine times to our facility. Hopefully they'll be coming a couple times. Um, but um, the therapy one is, we just have to be very deliberate about what we're doing and where. <laughs> If you have any other questions, we can answer them in the panel discussion, I suppose.
communication, I should say, in their quest to communicate, have it be a therapeutic exercise. So our job is for it to be um, within the realm of possible and ease of possibility rather than uh, physically difficult. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not going to add to that because I think Mary really covered it. But there is another question related to kind of the augmentative communication side of things. And so this one says, um, what is the best communication method for professionals, peers, and caregivers to use with individuals who use AAC? And then it says, for example, modeling AAC use speech, adjusted speech. Um, and so I think uh, kind of my two-part answer to this is I think what's written here is exactly right. Modeling AAC use and showing how it can be used within interactions is really uh, key to the success of an individual. So I think this kind of goes back to that idea that if they see that you are comfortable and you are willing to use that system and be patient and help them through what they need to do in order to communicate effectively, that's the best way for someone to feel comfortable using their system across these different individuals, different caregivers, different professionals. Um, the second part of the answer, I think, is a big key is just education for other professionals and peers and people like that who maybe don't have a lot of experience communicating with someone who uses AAC. And so I know Mary and I are doing our, our um, literature review for this presentation, found a lot of information about especially like hospitals and inpatient and just the need for more training and more um, knowledge about how these types of systems work so that people do feel comfortable when they go into those environments using their AAC systems with different professionals and peers and etc. Yeah, so do a, yeah. If you have a question, we can go to that and then go back to more. Do I see a hand? Oh, yeah. Go ahead up there, um, Kiana's mom. Sorry, I'm going to get you. Kiana's mom. <laughs> you will forever be known as no, Kiana's mom. No, you have a communication um, device. You know, you have different um, uh, low tech, mid tech, you know, and then the, the high tech. And you have different um, individuals. I'll give you an example. At my daughter's school now, um, there are other nonverbal kids. And a couple of them can actually touch, you know, and, and do things. But I have set up the device for Toby to see if they could use to, to use it. And it was just like a mind-blowing thing for them because they could look and they actually could communicate versus, you know, I mean, they could tactile touch. But when they saw that they're, what they looked at, it was just, it was just awesome to see. So do you, also do that, just um, gear it towards just those who are, are able to touch or do incorporate both? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, we have some users who use more than one access method like what you're describing. So you might have somebody who can touch a screen but in terms of their motor use, and Mary, maybe can add to this as well, in terms of their motor use, they might not functionally be able to use as much, or they might it might be more of a cognitive demand to put it all together and do it that way versus using direct eye contact with the symbol that you're choosing. So I think that's a good point that, just like we were talking about earlier, using a variety of different strategies and having different ones that work well in different areas is a key. And then I think another part of that is within that modeling and teaching that we keep talking about, one of the essential pieces is that partners are modeling the access method as well as the language. So um, the demonstration with the video where the person was scanning and they were, um, what was Mary's hand? But <laughs> the idea that you would be hitting a button and moving through and then hitting the second button to make the selection. When we're modeling for kids, we try as much as we can to not touch the screen directly as we're modeling, but use their same exact access method and show how to do it that way. So I think that's a really good point, that there might be different ways people use it, and then in addition, within how we're teaching them, we're showing them all the parts that put it together. And I would just add that I think families are really, I don't know if this is working. Yeah. Is it working now? No. It's just not working. Okay. Um, families are really important 
<coughs> people in these children's lives. And I think that um, I know that as a therapist, I am, I have to think about new ideas with patients all the time because families will come in and say, you know, I saw somebody with this device or I saw somebody with this um, new technique that people are using and, and would you use that? And I think that families and providers need to also bring about ideas about what children might be able to do. Like you were talking earlier about, you know, still using itsy bitsy spider with a child who's older. I think that sometimes we as providers too forget when we've seen children for so long that there might be something new. There might be a new interest they have. There might be a new activity that they do. And updating programs for these types of devices is really important. And I think that anytime families have questions about that, they should really ask providers so that we can think about that. Um, and, and move these children forward in their progression as well because I think sometimes we get stuck and so it's really great if families can say hey you know they're really interested in whatever Beyonce or a specific singer um, can we incorporate some of those songs in instead of using Itsy Bitsy Spider and, and so I think that you are just as an important piece of this puzzle as we are, and you give us lots of ideas about how we can expand our practice too. So these are great ideas. I just wanted to add that um, in that whole team approach towards helping them develop independent communication skills, that the physical and occupational therapists also work very heavily together on um, finding the right kind of positioning in the city so that there's maximized independence with those um, motor skills that are being used for um, for making the communication choices so that the child needs something like a bank, uh, trunk support to help improve upper motor function. Do they need to be seated in a particular way in a wheelchair? Um, what are the best ways to position and prepare for communication prior to initiating some of those activities? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll just add one other thing too is that when, when we do have children come to the clinic and we are looking at that full array of options and as we said in our talk it's not uncommon at all for a person to have several of those options depending on where they're using their communication and with whom and in what settings but it also can go the other way in that some families really would prefer to stay with just low, some more low-tech or mid-tech kinds of things simply because some of the high-tech things might not be either feasible or might be a little too um, extensive in terms of where they want to go with that. So we have some people who want to look at the array of options and really have the freedom to choose from them sometimes which ones meet their needs across which environments. The other thing that I would point out too is that while we do have some individuals who can use their hands to direct select as we call it on a device, it may, their motor skills, while they may be able to select, may limit them to only a certain number of messages on a page at one time, whereas another method, say eye gaze or scanning, might let them access a larger amount of vocabulary at one time. So we're always kind of looking at those, they're not all or nothing choices, they're this choice would allow you to do this, this choice would allow you to do this, and now if we have the time to look at them all, where do they best fit in any one person's day at any one time? So Mary, I guess make a comment on that. And being able to vary the type of input or device you're using is important too because sometimes if I'm trying to have a child do something that's physically very difficult and they're learning some new work skill, they're probably not going to be able to also do some new communication um, activity also. So falling back to the more low-tech stuff in a therapy situation is often um, something that we do just so that we can maintain and not break down communication during those times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to address a second, another question here. So what's next in cerebral palsy care and research? <laughs> That's a very complicated question, but it, it has some answers. First, we're starting just like, who are the people with cerebral palsy? We're still doing counting. And we don't know how many people with cerebral palsy are in our country, so we're working on databases. And from this, we'll look, too, at the tools we do have 
Botox injections, physical therapy, bracing, orthopedic surgeries. What what is the best for each person, and can we get better at predicting who needs what at what age? And so we're working really heavily on these outcome measures, so that we uh, we use the resources we do have in a better way. As far as looking at, at the level of cerebral palsy cure with stem cells and other technologies that are moving forward. That one is still a dream. We don't have anywhere near the type of tools that we would need to address the complexity of something like periventricular leukomalacia, what's going on right now with, with stem cells. But you never know, there are things that have come in you know decades of time that you would have never imagined before. So that's still um, more far away. One of the tools that people are learning a lot more about with the brain, and the Weissman Center has been very active with this, so it's more imaging what's going on in the brain in real time. So how is the left brain connected to the right brain in cerebral palsy? And when you're learning something, maybe your left side is weak, and you're exercising the left side, well, which side of the brain are you using to do that, and how does it communicate? Because you might be using the opposite side, the healthier, more vigorous side, to do something that's always done on the other side for other people. So we're learning more about how to take pictures of that in real time and um, understand not static pictures of the brain, but moving pictures of the brain. Where's the blood going? What's connected to what? Where are the weak connections? Where are the strong connections? So that's been very interesting, but it hasn't been yet very applicable. But we're starting to look at therapy and how do we change the brain with therapy? And that's been a, a kind of the newest rehab outcome area that we're, I think will have some more exciting benefits. I don't know if anybody had any other answers to what's maybe on the horizon with cerebral palsy care and research. You want to address the other? I think, I think we're all each going to have a, a <laughs> shot at this, um, this next one. Um, so the, the next question is, what do you think everyone should know about cerebral palsy? Um, and that's a, that's a broad in, uh, topic, but, you know, I think I, I, from, for, and I guess if we're each going to give this a little kind of specialty specific, I, I, I would say um, from an orthopedic standpoint, I think this slide, I gave a talk here last year, which I kind of did on the same thing Michael did, um, I think the GMFCS level slide is probably, from an orthopedic standpoint, one of the most important. Um, I, I, I think the biggest amount of time that I spend with patients in discussing doing orthopedic surgery is I'm not going to take your GMFCS level 4 child and make them a GMFCS level 2 child. That doesn't mean that there's not benefits for potential surgical interventions, but no matter how many times you have that discussion with families, um, that often People often think, that's not my child, you're just saying that. There, there is this feeling you tend to get from some families. And, and what I do know is I know the amount of pain and influence that I, I, I will have to put a child through to get them through the surgery and recovered, and, and they will be better. But um, when the expectation is my child still doesn't walk, no amount of me showing an improved x-ray or a little bit of improvement in a range of motion really makes that family satisfied. And so so I think having that GMFCS level and really discussing it and really understanding we are doing X, Y, and Z, and you can put therapy, you can put any intervention into that to, as Michael said, to maximize your child's functional, functional outcome is what our goal is in, in I think that would be the biggest thing I would try, and I try to discuss with families that this is why we are doing X, Y, or Z. Um, I've been really blessed to work with this population for my whole career, and um, my thoughts on cerebral palsy is that 
There are very, every individual is unique. While we do look at key areas, we look at GMFCS levels and tone levels and you know, range of motion and all the things that, you know, bless all our families who come into clinic and spend the, the morning with us, looking at all these different areas. For, for me, and I think for our team, the, the ultimate goal is participation and independence. And that can be defined differently for every different person and their family. So all the things that we look at and all the ways that we stay in, try to stay in connection with families each year that they come and throughout the time that they're with us, and as I think Matt alluded to, it's obviously not a condition that just stops when you're 18 and we need the adult side more robustly, it is that long-term look for how are you participating in your daily life, how are you participating with your family and the things that really matter to you and your family, and how are are we looking at things now so that as we look down the road and you get older and you're doing different things that those participation levels and levels of independence for whatever that means to you is still at the forefront and feeling like you're hitting your mark where you want to be. Yeah, um, my idea kind of uh, related to this question goes along with that and I think one thing that we talk a lot about in our clinic with not only individuals with cerebral palsy but any developmental or other diagnosis um, is thinking about the person and their long-term view and their long-term needs and how can you look ahead and say when this person is 20 and 30 and 40 how do we want them to be involved in their community and being self-determined and making decisions and being able to advocate for themselves and so especially from the communication side I think we all know that like Kiana's mom said you get out what you put in and we all know that there's so much going on in your lives and there's so much going on um, related to care but I think looking at how can we take the small steps that we need to accomplish along their entire lifespan to make sure that when we do get to the point where they're 20 and 30 and 40, we've been building all the important blocks and all the important essential skills ahead of time so that they can have more of that self-determination and um, independence and advocacy for themselves. Kim's okay. almost got a question. So we can either, I, we, I see your hand up. So we can either pause and. It's for um, orthopedic and PT. You know, we, we count, we're a society of sedentary people, you know, <laughs> and when you have a child in a wheelchair, I mean, that's the baby's in a wheelchair, and I don't want her to have more surgeries, you know, and I, I have a question about repositioning and the amount of standing that she should do so that we can avoid that. Which way does it go? Well, I think that um, standing is highly undervalued because, um, it, you know, in our medical reimbursement system, it's almost never covered if you need a standard. Uh, and the standing has many benefits that are more than just physical. So you do get muscle stretching, you get weight bearing and bone density issues. Um, you can help um, in a variety of ways, ways with the digestion and respiration and, and these kinds of physical things are important. But there's also um, the development of social skills and interaction with your peers and being seen as a more as being more like their peers because they are standing. And, and being able to integrate standing in classrooms I think is important for that reason as much or more than the physical ones. Um, I don't think it's ever, there's ever a time when you can stop standing if you can comfortably stand. Um, I don't know, what do you think about this? I'm going to stop on the way here, but the other big <laughs> important issue in people with cerebral palsy is bone density, and yeah. that is actually kind of a, a research area. We have a clinic now to further evaluate this, but the lack of movement in an upright position causes a lot of, well, in children, lack of formation of the initial bone density, more so than loss of bone density. When you're older, then it, it's, it's coming down. and. Um, 
the standard alone is not enough, but maybe as we move into finding out, maybe electrically stimulating the muscles and vibrating the body while standing, and we're hopefully going to move into something that actually is very helpful there. Um, that is better than the standard, but we don't have that. That's an area of research, a very important one. Something a little more dynamic, yeah. That, that yeah, and there may be more um, functional electrical stimulation options that can at least have a bone density, if not with mm -hmm. transfers or some standing activities for people that can't do that independently. The other piece on surgery is, so, and I spend a lot of time on this because they'll recommend something you know, and then I try to make sure that in the context, when your hips are maldeveloped and you're a young child, I like, and he told you you need to have that done, I'm really, so you need to do that because I know the long-term outcomes and how painful missing that opportunity could be. If it's a tendon lengthening or some surgery to help functionally and I don't necessarily agree it's going to help very much, I'll also give you have an option here. He's not going to push you to do that. It has to fit into the context of your life. So, you know, there's a different answer depending on what we're talking about because some things have a very difficult natural history and other things are really challenging for us even to advise and I, I've been there enough with you I know. <laughs> yeah I, I think um, so so a few a few items. One um, and I think this kind of gets back to the to the um, idea of some of it of GMS level and just what Michael was saying that that um, just because a child may not be a community ambulator does not mean there might not be a benefit to a surgical intervention, such as, as Michael said, if, if a child's hips are coming out, you know, we're, we're all trying to predict this, this, this future event and what that child's going to look like in 10 years, 15 years, who's doing okay now, but when they're 20, how, how will those hips be? They might not be walking on those hips, but are they comfortable? Can they sit comfortably? Can they be positioned for cares? And so, so that that's one side of it. The, the the question you brought up is, you know, with the standing and how do you try to weight bear to prevent future surgeries from being done? Sometimes those aren't independent. Some standing may help, as as we were talking about with with bone density, with social interactions. There are definitely some benefits to that. I, I would say this outside especially from a from an orthopedic standpoint i would say the two surgeries that all of the surgeries are elective but that i think are important are the hip surgery and potentially spine surgery for 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 children that need it because i do think those have multiple benefits regardless of activity functional level um, I think they help with comfort, I think they help with care, and I think they help positioning the body in a position to be interactive. Now, um, will standing prevent either of those? It may help with hip development and the growth of hip. We, we don't know enough, to be honest, and I think that's what Michael was sitting at, too. Outside of that, you know, I think when you're looking at any intervention, it, and, 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 and you hit on this earlier, you totally hit on this earlier, it, it can be physical therapy, it can be surgical intervention, and, and Michael was just sitting at this, there has to be a reason. There has to be a goal in mind of, I am going to do X to my child, not just so that I can get 10 degrees of motion. What is that 10 degrees of motion going to mean to her? There, there's got to be, you know, the hips I can say, despite what some of the literature says, I know kids who sips that are out and they are miserable. Like, I, I, if we can keep them in, I know they're gonna be more comfortable, hopefully, when they're older. So not everybody's sips are, are painful when they're out, but there are kids that are, and there's not a good fix for that. So I, I just think that's where that, that is important. If, if standing is important, and I don't make value judgments on what the family thinks is their goal. If their goal is, I want my child to be in a standard, we can do surgery to get your child in a standard if that is what is functionally important to you and them. And so, you, you know what I mean? But if, if you're like, I don't want surgery, she's fine sitting in her chair, 
the, the standing, if that was a family's viewpoint, that's fine. A lot of times we have children that are in chairs all the time that have contractions of their hamstrings, their legs don't go straight. That, that is okay. There, that, that's a choice to make, and the kids are functional in that position. So I wouldn't push them into a procedure because of it. there's got to be a goal, a goal in mind. I think we have to wrap up this part of our program to Could I just add like the one thing yes. that I think they should the know? One thing yeah. they should know. One, one yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to address the question about one thing I think you should know. And, and as a physical therapist, um, uh, I think it's important to understand the GMSS level of your child and to know that there is potential to improve function and quality of life within your GMSS level. Um, and that it, with therapy, you can, there can be some motor learning and um, improvement in quality of function. Um, and it's not something that is necessarily a waste of time if you're a level five kid um, versus if you're level one. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to know is that in childhood, with cerebral palsy, you have an ever-changing landscape. And you will feel at times that you've made two steps forward and three steps back and then five steps forward and one step back because the child is growing and things are changing the spasticity the muscles pull on the bones and you can develop deformity even with the best intentions the best prevention and that's why as a team we're all trying to work together to try to maximize function and, and keep the child moving forward as much as possible but that you will see this kind of just you know up and down kind of progression through childhood I would like everybody to know that this is, you know, if you're a family member, this is your child. We encourage everybody to ask whatever questions you have. You know, they say that there's no silly question. That's true, but unless you ask us, we won't know kind of where to help guide you. So please ask every question that you have, because if we don't know where you're coming from, um, like Dr. Holansky was saying, there are some families who prefer not to do certain surgeries, and that it's not maybe going to benefit their child. And we want to know all of those kinds of things so that we can help give you the best information to help guide you as to where you need to go next. So please ask us questions anytime you have them. Right. I think you can leave it there for the next group. have our community panel share some of their experiences as either family members or people with um, that have cerebral palsy. So maybe what I'll do is to start off, <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to each of you to introduce yourselves. So we'll start here with Mike. My 
my name is Mike Hippo. How is the sound with that in the back? Can you hear that? Yeah. I can hear it. Okay. Hi, I'm Sue Hippo, Mike's mom. I'm Chris Wartman. Jesse Wartman, our son's not here, but he's nine and has cerebral palsy. I'm Michelle Dover, um, this is my husband Peter, and Edward is our son, and um, he is uh, going to hang out here with us and <laughs> sing for a little bit, probably. <laughs> so we have prepared some information for some questions and have tried to incorporate some of the questions that um, you as audience members submitted. So we've um, kind of mapped out some specialists on various questions. So I'm going to start out with um, our first question, which is, when did you first notice a difference in your child's development, and what was the diagnostic process like? And um, Jesse and Chris, you were going to kind of take the lead on that one. So I'll start off with that one because our path wasn't um, a little bit more atypical, I would say, because Jonah was born full term, actually two days overdue, weighed eight pounds, one ounce. Um, definitely no prematurity, no low birth weight. Um, uneventful pregnancy, uneventful labor. He seemed like a typical kid when he was born. He was uh, our second child, so things just seemed to be like every other situation with his sister until it was time for those developmental milestones like sitting up, crawling, and walking. And he was delayed with sitting up, he was delayed with crawling, but as a therapist myself, I'm an occupational therapist, I kind of waited for that developmental window to be on the latter end of that. When he wasn't doing it, I facilitated it, and then he was doing it. Well, that was all fine and good until it was time to walk. And then we had significant toe walking. Um, we got Bertha Three involved. His therapist is here. We got her involved. And um, still, by the time his third birthday rolled around, he looked like he should be in the Madison marching band because his gait pattern was so atypical. High knees, pointed toes. And so um, with Birth to Three ending, I started to look into what our resources were. I called the gait clinic, um, looked it up online, called gait clinic. They're like, oh, well, you have to see Dr. McLeish before you'd be able to come to gait clinic. That'll be a nine month wait. And my heart sunk and I thought that, what are we gonna do for the next nine months? So we continued on and three weeks later, I got a call from the UW saying that Dr. McLeish has a cancellation tomorrow. I'll never forget it because it was Jonah's third birthday the next day. Um, so they said, will you come? Well, of course, I called Chris, we dropped everything, we were there. We drove home actually somewhat excited because we finally had an answer for why our son was walking on his toes all the time. But then the next day it sunk in that he has cerebral palsy and then the tears came. So so that was our beginning journey. Thank you. <clears throat> our next question, um, Mike, you're going to take the lead. Uh, what has been your experience with inclusion? Experiences with inclusion are awesome and sad because as an AAC mentor and a person with CP, I think kindergarten through sixth grade, they do everything to make sure that everyone is in the same classroom and has the same experiences. I found that middle and high school inclusion is limited. I was fully included, but I had a lot of obstacles in science and math. I always will remember my middle school experience. I have a friend who I knew him since first grade. In two years of middle school, he talked to me two times. I asked him about this because I wanted to know why. His answer was he was too embarrassed to talk to someone who has a disability. I believe that kids should be together in classrooms and all teachers should teach all students. And um, Michelle, Evan, and Peter, you're going to add some things to that as well. Well, we moved back uh, to Wisconsin, which is Madison's my hometown, um, last summer. After being gone for about 25 years, the boys were born in Kansas City. That has a, a brother who's about 17 months older than he is. Um, up until the time we moved here, um, Ed was in a private school for individuals with severe um, physical and cognitive disabilities. And I was discovering over the course of probably about a two-year period before we moved that I was seeing signs of um, 
pretty pronounced regression, um, mostly cognitively. Um, he just wasn't engaged. He wasn't um, responding. Um, he was not doing the things that make him Edward. And it was because there was a lack of involvement, community involvement, inclusion. Uh, he wasn't getting what he needed. I'm a firm believer that the reason Edward um, is here um, today with us is that we have always included him. We have always engaged him. Um, this is a child that wasn't supposed to survive to delivery. Uh, we were on hospice care even perinatally and um, told that basically we'd hold him for a couple of minutes and um, say goodbye and he'll be 16 in February. And I am convinced it's because everything we've done, we do with him. We go to the store, we go to the library, we go to the movies, we make it work. Um, and I wanted an educational environment that was as inclusive as possible for him as well. I wasn't the only reason to move here. He's bigger, he needs more help, I need more support, so we came to be closer to family. But one of them was so that his school environment would be um, as inclusive as possible. And we've been thrilled. Thank you. Um, the next one, um, there was a lot of passion in talking about, and that is, what is one thing you would like to tell teachers in schools? And I think, Jesse and Chris, you were going to start us out on that one. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're very fortunate, I think, inside of our school system um, in, in Monroe, Wisconsin. We've got um, a very good structure. Um, the only thing is, is when Jonah first started out, um, he's, he's in a walker, and Jonah just falls a lot. Um, and it's just part of him. For us, it's all right. We see it all the time, but um, anytime he would stumble, slip, fall, anything of that nature, we'd find ourselves getting a phone call. Um, it's to the point now where as Jonah's falling, he'll tell you he's okay. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, he's, he, he understands that he does, and it's kind of just getting the teachers to adapt that he's not fragile. Um, he's just he's a tough kid um, and that we don't need phone calls all the time he can advocate for himself he's gonna tell you what's wrong um, it's it's uh, it, it almost has the stigma disability means he can't do X and Jonah can do just about anything else any other kid can and to to be all right with him and trust Jonah that um, it's all right Peter's making me do all the talking, so <laughs> <laughs> not trying to exclude him. Um, we were talking about this back in the um, conference room, and that's exactly where we were on point, um, at least on this set of parents, that he's not fragile. He's medically um, complicated, but um, he will not break. And every year it seems to me to go in and have almost a crash course, and I really <laughs> appreciate the fact that you are so conscientious about caring for my child. I mean, obviously he needs more than a lot of typically developing kids would. You need to transfer him, he has shunts, he's too fed, he's incontinent. The hands-on care is a lot, and I appreciate that. But this is my cell phone, and it does not need to ring every two minutes. And I need to go to yoga sometimes and turn it off. And unless he's fallen and concussed himself, or you know we're having some real serious issues, in which case I'm following the ambulance to the hospital, you guys are really capable of caring for him, or I would leave him in your care. So be cognizant of his abilities and disabilities and his care needs, and yet treat him like any other kid, because he is just a 16-year-old boy, um, ornery, cranky, and a lot of other the same things. Um, and I, I'll always be there to respond. That's part of life with a, with a child like Ed, a young man like Ed. I will be there in a heartbeat. We just built a home that's three blocks from the high school. Now there's seven kids between us, and so we've got a bunch of kids in the high school. But the reason we did that is because if I have to be there, believe me, I'll be there. Uh, I'll fly to that school. But for the most part, you guys got this. You got it. Thank you. I think somebody had mentioned, too, um, going to the school early on in the school year. Is that you, Sue? Yeah. One thing that Mike and I figured out at a really young age um, is the more information we provided to his classmates and the teacher, it just worked a little better. So in 
kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, I would go the first day or two of school. I talk about um, Mike's situation. I talk about his equipment. We let them use his communication device. We let the other kids try to drive his power wheelchair. That's a little scary, but it was a little fun. <laughs> and actually, it created a lot of empathy um, on their part, too. A comment we heard was, wow, this really isn't very easy. I know why he bumps into walls. Um, so that was a, a bonus. Um, and then Mike started doing it himself in third and fourth grade where he would record a message on his device mm. telling his classmates about himself and he'd always end with the same thing um, like we're saying i'm just a regular kid just treat me like you would anybody else all right thank you um the next topic is behavior and i think there was a question from the audience about discipline um so i think jesse and chris you were going to talk a little bit about that um I think that the question as for any par parent is, is there consequences or is there not for any parent? And so that doesn't change with a child with a disability. So we say yes to discipline and to consequences, but we say yes with modifications, just like anything else that we modify for him. Because for with our son, as Dr. Ward talked about, there's a lot of other um, cognitive and emotional uh, challenges that happen with Jonah. He has attention deficit disorder, he has anxiety disorder, he has um, spastic diplegia, cerebral palsy. There's a layer of things happening. So what we found to be the case, he has slower processing. We're discovering now at nine years old an expressive language delay and he, um, we didn't realize that when he was two, three, and four years old when he really needed to have those direct consequences for his behavior. Looking back, and I think what we did at the time was fumble through it, but we found that there still needed to be consequences, it just needed to be modified. How, you know, just to say go to your room, Jonah wasn't gonna be able to get up and go to his room, you know, it, so there was that variable, do we have to carry him there? We did, you know, and to show him that there's a cause and effect relationship here. With that slow processing, he also doesn't necessarily put together the behavior with the consequence, even if it's immediately following. It took repetition, consistency, years of him pairing the behavior with the consequence for him to understand that they they go together. And now looking back, that's probably a big part of like a processing language piece that he wasn't getting at the time. So we say yes to yes. consequences. So the next question has to do with transition to adulthood and kind of balancing support and independence. And um, Mike, you were going to take a lead on that question. My communication device helped me through high school and transition by helping me to communicate my wants and hopes for the future. It helped me be an active member on my IEP team and be an active community member. My IEP coordinator made sure that I was ready to leave high school with the help of my whole IEP team. We started talking about my transition in fall of 2010. I used my communication device through high school to work on my schoolwork, my homework, to tell people who worked with me what I needed help with and how I felt. I used my communication device with my peers to talk with them about the game last night. I wanted to get out in the real world, so I left high school with my peers at the age of 18. My decision to not go to college was hard and easy. It was easy because I knew it will take all of my time up and I wouldn't be able to help families and volunteer for things. It was hard because I knew that I would be missing out on college experiences. Another reason that I didn't pick the college road is I know the unemployment rate is high for AAC users. The school helped me experience the real world by having me out in the community every day in the afternoon. They had two rules for me. They wanted weekly scheduling mailed to the whole team so everyone would know where I was going to be. Their second rule was I couldn't come home until 3.15. <laughs> I volunteered at a school with an AAC user helping him with his communication device. I wanted to work with kids so I volunteered at the care center to see what I could do. 
I was interested in working with children who have autism, so I had an internship with an autism agency. I wish I have been able to meet with a Kiwanis member, because I wanted to join the Kiwanis club right out of high school. So, please remember about service organizations and transition plan. Thanks. The next um, question as we were preparing um, had a lot of uh, a lot of responses from a couple of our families. Um, what is the one thing you'd like to share with other parents? And um, I think we were going to have both Jesse and Chris and Michelle and Peter talk about that. Um, so the one thing I would want to say uh, to other parents, but also to other professionals and in our discussion as a group, it, I'm not sure that there's a real easy answer for this, but it was hard to be prepared for people staring because it wasn't a question of if people were going to stare, it was when people were going to stare. And sometimes, um, you know, it, being human ourselves, it just depended on what mood you were in that day or what emotional state you were in that day to say that you could handle it well or not well. <coughs> But really, as parents, I think for all of us sitting up here, what we want is to educate other people about our children and what who they are as a person. And so you want to be able to do that well when people, when you have those opportunities, when people are either staring or um, asking questions or whatever that is. And so um, I wish there would have been somewhere along the way. I don't you know if that would come from the therapist, the doctors, or when we'd even be able to emotionally handle that in the stages we've went through um, as parents of children with cerebral palsy, but it, I would like to have had a heads up to say, you're gonna get in some tough situations or some really mild situations. What are you going to say? How would you like to come across? How do you wanna deliver this message that your child is like everyone else or that they have struggles or that they, um, like I, I gave the example of our son has a, a close one close friend in school and they've known each other for three plus years and for the first time we saw Jonah clam, clam up with his friend when we I was in the car with them and I was actually parked and they were talking in the back and his friend turned to him and said so Jonah how long have you had those braces and it just struck me you know he sounded older than his own years the way he asked him and Jonah just clammed right up and said I don't want to talk about that and I had never seen him respond like that, but I also think he wasn't prepared that he was going to have questions like that, even from a close friend. So I uh, interjected at that moment, and I said, you know, Jonah, maybe you could ask Shane how long he's had his glasses. And he loved that. He immediately said, so, how long have you had those glasses? And Shane said, for six years. You know, so, and he had the, Shane had that answer ready immediately, how long he had glasses. Jonah hadn't, we hadn't walked through that to say, well, people are going to ask you things like such. How would you like to respond to that? Or sometimes he doesn't want to. And he would say, like when he was younger and we'd see kids at the park and they would come up and just stare and just be like, just absolutely paralyzed with what is wrong with you? Or why are you wearing those big plastic white things on your legs? And the biggest question was, can you still walk? You could see the question in their head without them even saying it. So I would facilitate that and say, well, do you want to touch his braces? And they'd come, they, yeah, absolutely. And they'd come up and they'd knock on the braces or rub them, and then they would all go off and play. Like, they just needed to get past that question. Well, then he got to an age where he didn't want me to say that stuff anymore. And he'd stand behind my leg and he'd say, don't talk, Mom. You know, so I had to respect that, too, that that strategy worked for a while. And then later on, as he got older, he didn't want to utilize that strategy. So being prepared for how you're going to respond to people's questions and um, curiosities and fears and the whole nine yards. Michelle, you were going to add some things, too? Uh, yeah. Um, I've Over the course of the last couple of years, especially, I've just realized that, you know, the um, other, the way parents teach their children about people with disabilities is phenomenally important. And I was just thinking it was just, it was Halloween on Monday and we had Edward in the garage with a bowl of candy to help pass it out. And we just moved into this new neighborhood and there's a plethora of little kids. I mean, it's just overrun. And they're coming up the driveway and it, you could tell the piece of concrete where those children were going to stop and just almost fall over because they saw him sitting in the wheelchair mm. and they were paralyzed. They were scared. And I noticed 
that a lot of the parents stayed on the sidewalk. And I remember thinking, if you just come up a little ways and bring your child closer to mine, that chasm of, you know, fear and um, the knowledge base needs to grow. And I'd like every parent to know that's up to you to teach your child how to respond and how to interact with people, all people. Um, because I'm sitting here on one end of the driveway and you're down there, Let's, there's got to be a middle ground and our kids can be together on this planet and in this school or on this street or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then also we talked about siblings um, and I was thinking about Max, my 17 year old, they're so close in age and yet they've been treated completely different in a lot of ways because of their developmental um, differences basically. And Max was one of my best advocates for his brother growing up. And we would take him to the playground, and you could see the look on the kids' faces, you know, oh, there's that kid in the wheelchair, or the kid cart, or whatever it happens to be, and the questions and the fear and everything. And here's my four-year-old toddling up going, oh, my brother's disabled. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and cut through it all. There was no need for anything. This is just life. This is how it is. And let's go play. And that needs to be more and more incorporated. We can use, not use, but our, our children can be, our typically developing children can be our best asset and support in that regard sometimes by helping to integrate their siblings into the world. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I add something? Oh, sure. <laughs> the one other thing that I wanted to add is as parents, too, um, we value um, the medical profession and we value the therapists that work with our kids, but you know, go with your gut. Um, you know, you gave the example that um, all the accomplishments that Edward made, he made those because you believed in him. And you know, we've always believed in Mike. You know, we would have had lots of opportunities not to try speech with Mike. Uh, and as you've probably figured out by now, he has a lot to say, and he's pretty articulate, articulate at saying it. So again, as parents, you know, believe in your kids. Um, and just because someone tells you that they're not going to hit this, that, or another milestone, don't stop trying. Believe in them um, and, you know, give them the opportunity to surprise everyone. So, Sue, so you might want to hang on to that um, microphone for a second because our next question we're, we're going to direct your way, and that is, what can you do for an outlet or to find support? As a parent, I found support very important, and you know, for myself, um, I have a support group that I've gone to for a long time with moms and dads of other kids with differing abilities. Um, Mike's passion for AAC is kind of, um, he's brought the whole family along with that, so I'm really excited about the AAC network mentoring um, other uh, families, providing support to AEC users, because we didn't have any of that when we started out in 2001, and it was pretty lonely <laughs> being the first one in the Appleton Area School District with the device. He and I have had, uh, yeah, you laugh now, but it was pretty lonely then. <laughs> um, we had the opportunity, a lovely opportunity, to be at Camp Chatter Matters um, and to be at, hopefully of support to the families that were there. Um, and we had a chance to be at a conference um, two days before we were here, so we're getting more of an opportunity for that. So I'm really looking forward to being of support, providing mentors to AAC users and support to families. Another thing when we talked about siblings, and you know, and some of you might have already know about this, but there's an organization called Wisconsin Sibs, a wonderful organization that puts on um, in services and for adult children as well as younger siblings, you know, because it is different growing up. Um, there's wonderful things and there's challenges. And I think Mike's, not I think, I know, now I'm gonna cry. I know Mike's brother Doug is a better person because of Mike. My other families wanted to mention some things about siblings as well. I think we would agree that Anna is a better person because of her, her brother Jonah. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that when Jonah went through um, his one of his major surgeries, his uh, dorsal selective dorsal rosotomy, uh, 
he was at UW for five weeks and it was very intense and they had a place at UW for Anna to go to his sister called Tyler's place and she to this day you know he had his surgery four years ago she gets birthday cards every year and she that is her her lifeline for when that very tragic event happened in her life at the time she was seven and I looking back hindsight is 2020 we realized that that affected that procedure probably affected her more than anyone in our whole family. She was the one who was um, shuffled around. Yeah, it was between close family and friends, but Chris and I and Jonah slept in pretty much the same room every night in that hospital room. That became our home, our bedroom, whereas she was every two to three days going to a different family member's or a different, you know, friend's house, and she was we think affected quite emotionally as well because she really if you could just imagine as a close family member when you're worried about your um, other family member having an intensive procedure and then to be developmentally not able to understand what's happening with them um, th there was a lot of need for su for sibling support at that time and even to this day I think it's stayed with her for a long time did you want to speak to that oh, you no. did you talked yeah about I did already, already. Yeah. okay all right, so our next question, Mike, you're on the lead for this one. Um, as a person with cerebral palsy, can you share about friendship and community involvement? I have four communities that I am in. They are the AAC community, the autism community, the special education community, and the Kiwanis community. I am starting Wisconsin Augmentative Alternative Communication Network to give support to families and professionals. We will mentor individuals who are using AAC. The percent of children who have autism and are nonverbal is very, very high. It is my mission in life to make sure that everybody has a voice. The special education community. I'm on the state council. I'm on the council for the Department of Public Instruction to know what will work for all students. I'm on the council for the Department of Public Instruction to know what will work for all students. I'm in Kiwanis, which is a service club. I feel great about helping people who are in need. The more people see me and people who have a disability as equals in the community. So the next area that we'd like to talk about a bit is the topic of bullying, which isn't a topic most of us like to think about, but yet families encounter that like any family, people with disabilities also encounter it. So um, Jesse and Chris, do you want to start us off on that topic? Yep. So we just recently um, started experiencing some bullying and our approach with it was, uh, I guess, it kind of ties back to inclusion, right? Is that bullying is bullying. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with our child having a disability. To us, it's, it's not relative. And we put the onus back on the school for that. That if they're going to have some sort of special guideline or outline because Jonah has a disability, then that wouldn't work for us. Um, but it didn't go that way. Um, it, it was. It was just as it was taken as bullying was bullying. And handle it as you would any other situation. And that's exactly what happened in, with us. So um, not a whole lot with that. I think it's just on us as parents to make sure that it, it, it's no different. Um, it impacts kids the same way regardless of the situation. Kind of the same in the same boat. We are just now starting to experience bullying. I mean, it's it's everywhere. You you read about it. You see it. You hear conversations about it. I was shocked that it wasn't more relevant in my mind until just the other day, um, or in my life with him, a young man drove by in a car, we were waiting for the school bus to unload him, and yelled um, a horrible thing out the window at me about him. And I think if Peter hadn't been there to like basically hold me down, I would have <laughs> been after that car. And, and I was not shocked so much as just the, the intensity of my feeling about it. And I think well, he's my son and I love him, 
um, with everything I have, but it's like he's so trusting and I'm so protective of him and I can't believe that somebody, in my own mind, I'm like, of course this happens to people. We, we're reading about it, we're seeing it, unfortunately. It's, it's a very sad state of affairs. However, nobody would do that to Ed, right? I mean, he's love personified, you know, he doesn't know fear, he doesn't know anger, he doesn't know um, that people hurt each other. And to me, it was a real eye-opening experience, like that's, that's part of our world and he's part of that now and it just, it was just a really gut-wrenching five minutes of wow. And then just that onus of the, having to protect him even more. You know, and not wanting to hover over him. It was it was a really strange afternoon. Um, and I, you know, I have another child, and I'm sure he's. I know he's been called names and been exposed to. I hate to say typical, but I mean, he's been picked on too. But there's something about Edward that was really, really hard to wrap my head and my heart around. And um, it's something that I need to work more on. I mean, obviously, I can't chase down the cars, although I, I would have. <laughs> if my better half had been standing there, I probably would still be running. But, um, but it's something I'm going to have to work on, and how do I respond to that as time goes on? And he does get older, and he does get more involved in the adult community, because unfortunately, I don't see that type of ignorance going away anytime too soon. And that's a very sad comment to have to make, but that just means it's more incumbent upon us to talk about and address um, the needs and expectations and the beauty of the people that make up our disabled community. Um, it just it makes our jobs perhaps more difficult, but ever even more necessary than, than ever. So um, one of the topics that um, was brought up in some of the questions from the audience was the issue of pain and communication about pain and addressing it as a family. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? For us, <clears throat> for Jonah, um, again, this speaks to what Dr. Ward, you know, his slide on this was typical of Jonah, where sensation, perception, so when it came to pain, um, we have to watch very closely. He wears orthotics, AFOs. We have to watch closely to see if he has um, markings or any indication of pain because we think there's definitely that uh, decreased sensation there. Did you want to speak to pain? Uh, Ours is basically very similar. It's, it's a very, um, very close eye, very vigilant, very conscious of watching him because he is nonverbal. Um, in terms of what most people will be able to understand him and what his needs and um, most of the time Ed is 95, 99% of the time Ed is laughing hysterically and there's really, we have a medically fragile child <laughs> very, very low maintenance. This is Ed. If, if it, that's it. Very good. I'm if, he, if he's crying, if he's upset, there is something wrong. And, but we teach our caregivers and other people that come into contact with him what to watch for and when to, when to and pain is, pain is crying and it's crying hard and, and it's not very hard to figure uh, out, but you've got to watch. Uh, <laughs> that's not pain, that's happy. <laughs> so we were going to touch on two, um, uh, audience question was name two resources that help you most, family, community, school-based programs, peers. We've talked a little bit about siblings. I didn't know if there was anything else um, don't forget about camps for your kids. Um, you know, a Chatter Matters is a wonderful AAC camp for kids, I think, 6 to 16, um, right here in the Milwaukee area. And it's free. What's not to love about that? I um, mean, the whole family goes. Another camp that Mike went to from 12 till 21 is Authentic Voices of America. Again, it's another AAC camp right here in our backyard. It's at UW-Whitewater, um, another awesome camp. So remember about camps for your kids. I just got the word we have time for one more question. And so um, looking at some of our earlier discussion, we were talking about advocacy. Kind of uh, one of the questions from the audience was um, things that you had to advocate for, um, whether it's change or equipment, whatever. So maybe our final parting shot will be um, advocacy. Yeah, so uh, I, we've always been challenged. Jonah's in fourth grade, and um, 
we actually dropped Jonah off at a place that is Five minutes, not, even. not even. It's probably about a quarter mile from the school. And the big reason why we do it, and we pay extra for it, is so we can actually, he can get to the front door. Other than that, they have no option for us to drop Jonah off. That's feasible. That makes sense. Um, and uh, we can't pull in the front um, and actually just open up the door, get his walker out, and, and send him on his way. They don't allow us to do that. So um, it, it's a it's a head scratcher for us. Um, but here we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll speak a little bit to it too. Part part of it is because of the um, everything has to be locked now in the schools. You know that's so hard. Every door, every window, every access point has to be locked down. So the front door is the only door that is open when kids are coming into school. Well, that's where all the buses drop off. And so it's really, you, you can't pull up in between buses and you know spend all the time getting him in his walker and getting him in the front door. So we kind of found a loophole around that by taking him to the local YMCA and then they will bus him. He comes in on a bus then to the front door. So accessibility can still be a challenge even when everything else in the building seems accessible. That's something we can't get around. So. Um, one of the questions was, or at least I thought it was, like if all of you, you know, you've got such brain power out here in the audience, you know, if there was something that could be invented to help Mike's life. The three things we want you all to work on for us are <laughs> extended battery life for AAC devices, a screen you can see outside, please, that would be awesome. And there's just so many, um, you know, when you talk about friends, Mike has friends, but you know what? Their houses have steps. So, you know, if there was a wheelchair, affordable wheelchair, that could get up four or five steps, that would be nice, too. <laughs> so we'll put that on our Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to add anything? Did you want to? Yeah. One last thing. Um, I think that advocacy is the name of the game. Um, it's what we do for all our kids, typically developing, or otherwise there's just a whole other realm of it when you're dealing with a child whose needs are, are so significant on a daily basis. And um, uh, I applaud all the parents who do it every day um, and also want to thank all the professionals that help us to advocate for our kids because um, it's a sea out there. I mean, it's from insurance claims to uh, just the everyday nuts and bolts of, of caring for him. Um, Peter, I took him to an appointment at um, the Children's Hospital and I ran into the restroom and there's a life-size, adult-size changing table in the restroom. I'm snapping pictures of it with my phone and I'm sending it to him. This woman next to me is like, oh, this is getting kind of creepy. She's taking pictures of the bathroom. But so something like that is just phenomenal. All of a sudden, I can change his diaper without going early and asking a kind nurse if I could find an exam room that is empty for this or that. And that's the result of advocacy. Some parents, some people, some wonderful professionals got together and said, let's make life just a little bit easier for these people. And that's amazing. So, so Mike, were you going to add something there? So you're typing away He's here. typing <laughs> feverishly. Did you want to go first, Jesse? Did you have something? I just real quick wanted to thank the professionals in the room because we did we have utilized the UW system from the day he was diagnosed on his birthday. Um, Dr. Ward, Dr. McLeish, Dr. Holansky, Betsy Zahn, you know, all the therapists who have and physicians who have been with us along the way. The UW has been amazing. All right. And Mike, you're, you have a parting shot here too. talk about AAC evaluation. Having access to an AAC evaluation, I know that Mike's one of, um, and is it okay if I fill that in a little bit? Mm. So one of Mike's passions is really to make sure that every person that needs an AAC evaluation and related services would access that. I think you've set the age of seven, is that right? 
You want, you want them to have it as soon as possible, but you don't want any child to go beyond. As soon as possible, and then ongoing evaluations. Mike worked Updates. with his local legislator and set up a town hall. How cool was that? Yeah. And I found out about it afterwards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always finding out about things afterwards. So yeah, I work on that. So really kind of advocating that every child needs a voice. Yep, needs a voice and evaluation, and then ongoing evaluations because technology changes and our kids' abilities change. I can't tell you how many times we're at a grocery store, conference, anywhere, people will come and they'll come, well, what's that? How does it work? And we'll say, well, has your child had an evaluation? Well, yeah, when they were in kindergarten and nothing was ever done about that. We don't want to hear that second part anymore. We don't want to hear nothing was ever done about it. We want to hear that they were evaluated then, reevaluated in a couple of years, and then reevaluated again. Because um, there's so many devices out there. There's a device out there for everyone. We just got to find the device. So I would say I would be a number one fan of that objective. <laughs> so anyway, thank you panelists for contributing to a lot of really great information for our group. And I think that concludes our day. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>